everyone, I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, hello, and welcome to Spindle TV. Hope you all are doing well this evening. Tonight we are going to go over some fundamentals and some basics and things, and I want to talk to you all about a new structure that I'm looking at uh, with regards to the Spindle TV training videos and uh, kind of get your thoughts and all. Ronnie? Thank you, sir. I appreciate you too. I uh, want to welcome Roger, John, Charles, Ronnie, Ed, Mike, as always, Jeff, Kevin, David, and George, everybody that's dropping in on us. I want to thank you. So, what I'm looking at here, guys and girls, is I got a lot of um, uh, individuals that have uh, provided feedback. Uh, with regards to Spindle TV and some of the classes that we do, some might be a bit uh, advanced, you know, because they're just beginning. Uh, some would like to see more projects out in the shop at the CNC machine and not just Vetric projects and things. And I'm taking all that into consideration. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at uh, doing a trial run for the next uh upcoming couple of weeks to where on Tuesday night we would do our normal classes like we do, but possibly um, Thursday or Friday evenings uh, doing a in the shop with Laney at the CNC machine, or we might uh, do a project from start to finish uh, working with things like Aura Mask and testing out methods like uh, the two-sided tape method with CA glue and all of these different things. But one of the most requests I have is seeing if there is a way to divide up, you know, beginner fundamental classes with more advanced classes and things. And that I'm going to try to see if I can balance out uh, in one way or another. Um, but tonight, uh, one of the questions I always get is, does the software tell me what bit to use? depending on my project and all. And, and the answer to that is no, it does not tell you what bit to use. But with version 10, one of the things that it does do is within the software, it will, uh, when you open up a tool path to calculate, when you open up your tool database, it will eliminate uh, or not show the tools that uh, cannot be associated with that tool path. Um, but that still doesn't, you know, that, that that gets us into the categories and things like that. But it really doesn't tell us a lot about, you know, what bits we should use. And I want to go through and talk about um, V-bits, ball nose end mills, tapered ball nose and things like that and different specialty bits and all. But I'd like to start off with the talk about V-bits and uh, see if I can uh, demonstrate some things that may help you all out, you all, you all out. Um, and, uh, I want to welcome all these, uh, individuals that are coming in, uh, at the last minute, Roger, Wayne, Paul, Doug, Tippy, William, good to see you all, Charles Wallace, good to see you, buddy, and John. All right, let's jump over into the software and let's look and see what I've got laid out for us, uh, this evening. <clears throat> and, um. I've got a demonstration board kind of laid out with some uh, a variety of different uh, V bits. We'll we'll start talking about V bits because V carving is kind of one of the most common things that you're going to do with a CNC, uh, and uh, then we're going to progress from there. Now, this class is not going to be a three hour class. Uh, it's going to be you know, uh, it's not going to be a five minute class either. But we're not going to you know spend all night um, you know. Uh, three hours talking about bits and everything, but we are going to try to cover as much as we can to hopefully 
uh, maybe uh, show you some things that you may already be aware of or may not be aware of. We'll find out. And um, what I want to do is let's go ahead and get into it. And let's take a look at what we've got here. So from my immediate left here, I've got a 120 degree V-bit. Uh, this V-bit has a point height of 0.3594. Uh, with a cutting diameter of an inch and a quarter. Next bit is a 90 degree V bit with a half inch head, uh, which has a quarter inch point depth and a half inch overall cutting diameter. Followed by a 60 degree V bit, which has a 7 16 inch cutting height, 0.4375, with a half inch cutting head followed by an ever so popular quarter inch 60 degree V-bit, the white side 1541 in this case, uh, which is a quarter inch shank 60 degree V-bit with a 0.2188 cutting depth. And then last but not least, a 20 degree V-bit um, with a uh, 0.625 point height, uh, quarter inch diameter. Now, with these bits, we are going to expect different cutting heights. And one thing that I want everyone to understand is a V-carved toolpath has a start depth and a flat depth. The flat depth is a limit. It's not a cutting depth. It's a limit. So a toolpath will look at the space between two lines and it will automatically calculate how deep it needs to carve based on the width of those two lines and how deep it needs to cut based on the angle of the bit being used uh, to determine the depth. And sometimes our space could be narrow, sometimes it could be wide, and that's how we get different depths and everything, such as this uh, word hello. Uh, in our wide areas, we're gonna have a deeper cut. In our smaller areas, we're gonna have a shallower cut. And it's all going to be determined, determined by that angle of that bit. But if a cut was too wide and it was going to require the, or it was going to have the bit cut through the material, the software will warn us and let us know that it's going to cut through. And at that point in time, we have a choice. We could set a flat depth, which limits the cut, or we could change our bit to reduce that cut depth. Now a limit, if I set a flat depth of, let's say a quarter of an inch, what that's going to do is any part of the carving that would normally exceed a quarter of inch depth, it's gonna limit that and flatten it off at the bottom of that cut at that quarter of an inch. But all the rest of the cut that would not reach or exceed that quarter of an inch, it's going to cut to the normal depth that it's calculated on, again, based on the width of the lines and the angle of the V-bit being used. And a lot of times I get people confused with that with um, when we're looking at profile cuts, pocket cuts, and drilling operations, these tool paths, they have cut depths. These are depths of cut that we are saying, hey, cut down to this depth. In this case, a quarter of an inch that we have on the screen here. Um, and that is a cut depth. While the V-carved toolpath is a flat depth, which limits the cut. And it only limits the parts of the cut that would normally exceed that flat depth. It truncates that V and flattens it off. That's why it's called a flat depth. And <clears throat> When we are using things like a profile toolpath, a pocket toolpath, and things like that, we're typically carving from the top of the board down to whatever our cut depth is. But in the case of a V-carve toolpath, if our letters and all didn't have enough definition and we wanted to get a little bit more depth of cut out of that with the bit that we were using, then we would actually set a start depth. Small numbers. 10 thousandths of an inch, 20 thousandths of an inch, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, uh, because the deeper you go, the wider things get. But we would set a start depth to make that bit plunge in a little bit more during the cut 
which would then result in a deeper cut in those shallower areas, uh, giving us a little bit more definition in the line. And so what I want to demonstrate uh, for you is let's take a look at, um, we're going to take a look at our 90 degree V-bit first. We'll, we'll come back to the 120 degree V-bit, but I want to start with kind of the common bits and then we'll come back to this one. <clears throat> On the 90 degree V-bit, um, we have, what I've got here for you, a little demonstration is I've got a single line for a profile cut. I've got a variety of rectangles ranging from a 32nd, 16th, an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch. Oh, I'm sorry, an eighth of an inch, three sixteenths of an inch, a quarter of an inch, three eighths, and then a half an inch cut. So half inch, three eighths. Three sixteenths. I'm sorry, quarter. <laughs> Three sixteenths. Oh shit, I can't even get my numbers right here. Give me a second. Half inch cutting depth or cutting width. Three eighths. Quarter of an inch. Three sixteenths. Eighth of an inch. Sixteenth and thirty second. There we go. We got through it that time. And then uh, I've also got two sets of text here one being a script type text where we have some very small narrow lines uh and another with the text kind of just a regular almost like an aerial font if you will and if we were to look at um our cuts here let's start off with our 90 degree v-bit doing these individual uh pocket cuts if you will and they're not pockets they're v-carve cuts but we're letting the software calculate its own depth there's no flat depth uh put in here we are just v-carving this uh with a zero start depth and a zero flat depth to let it cut to uh, the depth that it's going to um cut to and let's take a look at how that um quarter of an inch end mill will react to those different cutting widths based on the angle of the bit. And I'm going to turn this up into the Y position here and let's kind of get up close and personal on this. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And so what we can see is on that 90 degree V bit <clears throat> at the 32nd of an inch cut, we're barely just breaking the surface. And let's get over to there. We're barely just breaking the surface on that. 30 second of an inch cut depth because it doesn't it doesn't require that much cut depth we're only going a 30 second of an inch deep followed by a 16th of an inch deep an eighth of an inch deep three sixteenths a quarter three eighths and then ultimately a half an inch now, if we look back at this bit, its cutting height is a quarter of an inch, the point height here. And if we go beyond that point height, then we're going to not only get the V cut, but we're going to get the straight edge of this bit in here, the cutter that's up in the vertical, and our cut will come down and then at an angle. But our cut depth has been limited to a quarter of an inch deep on this example and therefore i'm not getting that straight edge and also the one thing that we have to be aware of is that even if this bit were or this cut were three eighths of an inch deep i still wouldn't get that straight edge because the bit is going to come down and clear out this edge it's going to be stepping over clearing out this edge stepping over ever so further it's going to be stepping over and coming down for its past steps and things and it's going to clear it out and it's going to give us a nice v cut um no matter what at our point here but if i would have ran a profile toolpath which we'll see in a moment and we exceeded the cut depth then i could push that bit beyond its points cutting length and then get into the vertical and i may not desire that within the cut but now looking at these pocket cuts and things and kind of seeing how the different size 
the different width of those pockets determine the depth of the cut. We can kind of take this into account when we're working with words and letters. So with that being said, let's come down to our words and letters here and let's preview that toolpath and let's see what we have here. So let's go back into a full view. And if we look closely, and let's kind of zoom into this, if we look closely in our regular font where the, the line spacing is pretty well even throughout each of the letters, the fonts and all, we have a decent cut. And if we look down at the bottom of the software here, we can see the top of my board is zero. And as I move into the cut, we can see that we're cutting about 20 thousandths of an inch deep. And on that, um, and that's with the 90 degree V bit. So in order to cut the width of these lines down to a V based on the angle of the bit, it only, you know, cut down to about, you know, 20 thousandths of an inch in, in these wider areas. Well, what happens then when we have letters that have very small uh, areas and this font here on the hello, the space between these two lines is about seven thousandths of an inch, 0 0.007. And if we look at that, we can see that we're barely scratching the surface uh, when it comes to this 90 degree V bit. And so, in order to get the definition that I want with that bit, I would have to go back to that toolpath and add some additional start depth to make that bit plunge in um, and, uh, you know, the, the result may result in uh, where the letters start to blend together and not what I want. So I have to look at my font, my design, my project, and I have to determine what is going to give me the best result. Is it going to be the 90 degree V bit, maybe a 60, a uh, 22 degree V bit, 120 degree, you know, what is it going to give me the best result? And in this case, to get more depth and not really have to add a whole lot of start depth, the better option uh, is going to be change the angle of the bit. And so that will take us to, let's look at stepping over to a 16th of an inch end mill. 60, a, six, a 60, deg 60 degree V bit, not end mill. I don't know where I got to where that even came from. A 60 degree end mill. Now we can see already the point depth at 0.4375 is much greater than the quarter inch point depth here. And the angle, that 60 degree angle is much narrower. So I'm going to get more of a depth of cut uh, as a result of using this narrower angle. And so let's take a look at what that cut would look like. And then let's also look at what the actual V carve would look like on the uh, variety of boxes here and things. So let's preview that also. All right. So if we come over here, now we can see that. Uh, not only in our boxes and stuff that we're getting more definition. You can tell that by the shading, uh, the different color shading. And I don't know how well that translates on the screen and stuff, but we have a little bit darker shading. Uh, we're getting more of a depth of cut, but we are getting more definition in our cut here. Uh, not much more. If we come into that O where we were testing before, we are, you know, roughly about five, uh, 50, thousandths you know 0.052 a little under a sixteenth of an inch deep now but we're getting more definition out of that cut we can see the lines uh much better uh and things and if we were to look at the end view we can see that the same size vectors with the same parameters uh just letting the v-bit cut to its depth we can see that all the way from the uh small 32nd inch width uh, eight, three sixteenths, quarter, three eighths, all the way to half inch. 
that width, we're getting much more depth out of that 60 degree V bit than we are the 90. Now, with that, we're still uh, with the 60 degree V bit. We're we're okay with this regular font and all, but we're still kind of pushing it. Uh, you know, with this smaller font and these smaller lines and all, we're still kind of not quite getting the detail and everything that we would you know want or you know expect and again we'd have to give it start depth let's take a look at if i were to give this start depth what the um that start depth would do to this hello here so if i come in here and let's say we give it uh 20 thousandths of an inch start depth 0.02 and we recalculate that toolpath and if we preview that toolpath, that 20 thousandths of an inch is going to push those lines out. And now we're, in my opinion, we, you know, we've got some more depth and definition here at the lines, but we've also kind of, uh, you know, fattened things up and it's, it's not looking, you know, as, as good as we want. We're kind of blending things in, uh, in these areas and not getting that separation and stuff because of that that wider angle and all but we are definitely getting much more depth of cut now with that start depth and again a start depth is a, is, is a decent way to go there's nothing wrong with that uh, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to go too much of a start depth and really push that bit down in there and uh, and distort our design what we really want to do is we want to go and look at a narrower angle on our bit so I'm going to bring this back to a zero start depth and recalculate it. And let's go back and let's visit our other 60 degree V bit. Now, some people think that with a 60 degree V bit with a V bit with a narrower head that we're going to get a different result when in fact is a 60 degree V bit is a 60 degree V bit. And as long as we're not exceeding the cutting height of the point then our design is going to look the same whether we're using the 60 degree v bit with a quarter inch shank or a 60 degree v bit with a half inch shank so let's take a look at that so if we come in here and <clears throat> preview that visible toolpath as well as <clears throat> the letters if we were to oops i'm a goofball let me put those back i just hit the wrong button like an idiot let me go back up to the top here one two and three preview visible tool pass if we come looked at the cuts now and we straighten back up our 60 degree v-bit with the quarter inch shank and our 60 degree v-bit with the half inch head are the same we're going to get the same result 60 degrees is 60 degrees we're getting much more definition from these bits than our 90 degree V bit, but they're still the same. So changing the, the head size and all isn't going to make a difference when we're doing these type of cuts. It's going to make an absolute difference when we're doing profile cuts and things like that, uh, which we'll see in a moment. But let's take a look at our end results. Let's get into our kind of end view here. And if we look at these two side by side, we are toe to toe the same cutting height all the way down. And so changing the diameter of the head, you know, but using a 60 degree V bit is again, that's, that's not changing our results. Our letters, our words are going to look exactly the same. The top of our cuts, our pockets are going to look exactly the same. The cut depth is going to be the same. So that that's not changing the result at all. So now we need to come over and look at even a narrower bit, such as a 22 degree V bit or an 11 degree or something. Um, we have uh, 30 degree V bits and stuff. And I just went, I jumped straight to 22 degrees here. And with our 22 degree V bit, 
if we were to look at that cut, let me get down to that cut there and preview those visible toolpaths. Now, one of the things that we're going to notice right away, and if it's not abundantly obvious, um, we've cut through the material on two of these cuts, but let's look at our letters and everything here. So with our 22 degree V bit uh, on those same letters, we have much more definition and depth uh, in those cuts and everything. Now we're you know, almost about 0.1, almost an eighth of an inch deep uh, with the hello. And with our script text and everything, our fine point pencil liner bit can get uh, in there and give us uh, some definition. So we still have the nice fine lines, the separation in those lines and things, but we have the definition that we need. When it comes to wider cuts, uh, we run into this problem. Let's look at this at the end view here. And let's look at the same parameters. Nothing's changed. Uh, everything is, all the boxes are the same size and all. And on our 32nd inch wide box, uh, we have uh, good depth and definition on that line spacing. Our 16th of an inch definitely got some good depth there. Our eighth of an inch, three sixteenths, quarter of an inch, way depth and this is a three quarter inch piece of stock so quarter inch wide lines with a 22 degree v bit is nearly coming through that three quarter inch stock now my three eighths of an inch spacing that is cutting through and then my half inch spacing we've absolutely cut through by quite a bit and that's where we if we don't have a waste board on our table and things like that we could get in trouble if we don't heed the warning that the software will throw up and the software does throw up the warning uh i'll give you an example here if i were to select these objects here go into my v carve toolpath come in here and select my 22 degree v bit when i try to calculate this toolpath the warning that i'm going to get is the material thickness is a quarter of an inch it's going to require 1.286 inches for the depth of cut the maximum depth of cut and if I don't set a flat depth and limit that and I click OK, then in these larger areas, as you can see here, we are cutting significantly through the material. And depending on how thick our wasteboard is, we could be cutting through our wasteboard and into our, um, our tabletop if we don't heed that warning or if we don't use the appropriate measures and all. So the 22 degree V bit, while it is, um, optimal for giving us the nice definition that we need in our letters and things not optimal when the letters are very wide and stuff then we would have to set a flat depth at all and you can see even in that 30 second line look at the change in the definition of that line from our 22 degree v bit to our 60 which are both the same and then our 90 is very faint and let's come back now and let's look at a simple profile toolpath with each of these bits with a cut depth of a quarter of an inch let's look at what each bit is going to look like for us when we set a quarter of an inch cut depth uh, on those cuts so i'm going to sneak this right over here beside here and by the way to get that box to pop out for my toolpath it's simply double clicking on the toolpath tab here and so let's uh, take our 90, our 60 with a half inch head, our 60 with a quarter inch shank, our 22 degree V bit, and we can delete this one. And let's take a look at those. <clears throat> let's come over here and we can close this now and let's preview this visible tool pass. Okay. 
Now, each of these tool paths were set to cut a quarter of an inch deep. Uh, and let's start from right to left, our 22 degree V bit, quarter of an inch deep. Got a nice, you know, narrow line there. A uh, nice little hairline, if you will. Our 60 degree V bits, whether it's the, um, the uh, 60 degree with the quarter inch head, this is where the uh, differentiation is going to take place. When we were doing our V carve cuts and everything, there's no distinction between the two bits. But now we're doing a profile cut to a certain depth, and the depth of cut for the 60 degree V bit with quarter inch shank, the white side 1541, it only has a maximum cut depth of 0.2188 inches deep. While our 60 degree V bit with the half inch head has a cut depth of a point depth of 0.4375. So what we've actually done with that 60 degree with the quarter inch shank, we've actually collided the shank into the board and let's, you can't see what I'm talking about in this orientation, but let's turn it over on its side and let's zoom in on this cut. And you can see here that we have this straight edge and then the V cut. Well, on this bit, there is no straight cutting flute. It's all shaft. So once we exceeded the cut depth, of 0.2188, we are now colliding the shaft into our material and it's just burning that shaft through the material, um, that shank and everything. Now, we do have a little bit of a flute here that can kind of help alleviate some of that, but it's not going to alleviate it too much uh, and we're going to be running into it. So we end up with this, you know, the software is showing us that straight cut and everything. We don't get a warning about, you know, collision or anything like that, but we are absolutely burning up that shank right now because it's just bearing through because our V-bit's coming down and running a profile cut straight down uh, and um, we've exceeded the point cut depth and therefore we have this straight ridge. And if we're doing uh, cuts like inlays and things, you know, V-carve inlays and stuff, and we don't take into account the point depth, then we could absolutely create these uh, ridges at the top of our male part that will never fit into our female and things. So we got to take that, that into account. But let's come over here and look at our 60 degree V bit with the half inch head, which has a, you know, 7 16 inch cutting depth, much wider, you know, from our quarter inch to our, you know, uh, half inch head here, much wider at that particular depth of cut. And if we come in here and look at it, we are getting that nice V cut and we're not exceeding the cutting depth of the point and uh, we're not running in. Now, the difference between this half inch head and the quarter inch is this 60 degree V bit has a blade, a cutter on its straight edge. So even if we did exceed that cut depth, we are still using the cutters to cut. We'll, we'll end up with a similar looking cut as the 60 degree over there, but we actually are able to cut the wood where there's no collision and everything because there's actually cutters on that edge and all. And so let's get this back up here. And um, let's come back to our view and let's come over and look at our 90 degree V bit. So quarter inch depth of cut, 90 degree V bit. At 0.25 depth of cut, 90 degree V bit, we got a nice wide line. So we can see if we look at this in full view, oops, <laughs> let me get back into full view here. We can see that fine pencil liner at a quarter of an inch cut, our 60 degree V bit, which exceeded the cutting depth of the bit, our 60 degree V bit with the half inch head, and then our 90, we got a much wider line there. And, you know, um, Hopefully that this is showing you how the different angle of the bit plays a role with our cuts and all. And now let's take a look at a bit that we haven't looked at yet. Let's come over here and look at our 120 degree V bit. Now these wider bits, these wider diameter bits, these are bits that you're going to choose 
uh, when the letters or the spacing is quite wide and you need to minimize the depth of cut and you don't want to use a flat bottom, you know, option. You don't want to, you don't want to truncate the V. You want to just get down to that depth of cut if you can. Um, and, uh, you know, have a nice V shape. And I'll give you an example. If we are doing edge light, uh, uh, you know, edge lit acrylic signs, uh, typically those signs are going to be 0.354 inches in diameter. And if I'm doing a large sign, you know, with a logo or something in it, and the letters are quite big and things, uh, if I were to use a 90 degree, a 60 degree, a 22 degree V bit or something on that, then um, I only have 0.354 inches of material. And so I'm absolutely going to have to set a flat depth. And I usually would set a flat depth of about 0.2 inches. Um, but there's certain times where that nice prism pyramid, you want that when you're looking at it from the front. You don't want that flat depth uh, to really just kind of make it not look as good. So we're going to use a much wider bit. And I can, I can achieve that much wider cut with a wider headed bit uh, such as this and a wider angle such as this 120 degree V bit uh, without jeopardizing my cut depth or you know having to limit my cut depth or, or set a flat depth but let's take a look at let's take a look at this uh these tool paths here with this 120 degree v bit and then we'll get into some questions and stuff uh let's grab uh that there number number nine here and then finally number five there and even looking at it in the 2d view you can see what that you know at a quarter of an inch depth of cut what that that, that cut's going to look like but let's preview those visible tool paths and let's kind of get over here and get set up spin around there junior and let's preview those visible tool paths <clears throat> now right away uh the uh thing that we can see very distinctly is that it is not the optimal bit for doing text and things in smaller formats our letters are barely barely scratching the surface most likely in oak or something like you wouldn't even see the cut uh very shallow cuts um you know uh when we're carving in here the tonal difference the shade difference between our depths of cuts it the doing the wide pockets from our narrow pocket to our wide pockets and everything i want you to notice something no matter what bit we used no matter what bit we used the v carve cuts uh here all look the same everything is going to look the same the only thing that varies is the depth of cut so with my 120 degree v bit on my widest part here i'm cutting about uh 0.1 one inches deep my 90 degree v bit about 0 0.2407 inches deep my 60 degree v bit about 0 0.41 inches deep same thing with my other 60 degree v bit about 0 0.41 inches deep and then of course my 22 is all the way through <clears throat> and so let's now let's go over and look at the profile cut at a quarter of an inch deep and we can see we've got a much wider cut here on the top of our cut, uh, you know, compared to the 90 or even the 60 because of that 120 degree angle and the diameter of that head. The cutting head is an inch and a quarter in diameter. And at that quarter of an inch depth, we're rocking, you know, uh, a, a good amount. And if we look at it at the end here from our end view, we can see that at a 30 second width line not depth these are not depths of cut these are the width of the lines 30 second width line we're barely barely scratching the surface 16th eighth <clears throat> three sixteenths quarter three eighths and half inch and then this quarter inch cut as a profile cut cutting a quarter of an inch deep we've got a much wider frame so if we were to look at these all trying to fit them in end to end, we can see a very dramatic difference uh, between the depths of cut and everything based on the angle of the V-bit that we're using and all.
And so bit choice, <laughs> when you're doing a V carve or when you're doing, um, you know, something that requires, you know, uh, a, a V bit, then what's going to, there's nothing going to tell us what bit to use. What's going to tell us, uh, or illustrate to us what bit we need to use is that preview. And that's what I love about the preview here is our preview is going to tell us a whole lot. Um, and the, when we look at this and we look at like, you know, if I saw this in my preview, I would absolutely, you know, ultimately right then and there, that's time to make a change. I don't want to change the font. I could change the font, right? I could make the font wider or change the font or something and all and change it and everything uh, if I wanted to still use that bit. But I want to have an arsenal of bits in my toolbox that I can choose from and pick the right bit for the cut. I absolutely would, uh, for this cut, uh, if I was doing V cut with very fine scripture and things like that, the 22 degree V bit is going to give me what I want with those small letters and things. Um, uh, the aside from that, if I was doing profile cutting and I wanted a fine line at a certain depth, uh, then, you know, that 22 is going to do it for me because the deeper I go with the wider bits, the wider that, that line is going to get. It's not a fine line anymore. Unless I draw a rectangle and do it as a V carve, then it's going to, you know, keep the same, but the depth is going to change. And so these, um, this little illustration here is to show how these different bits react. And the one thing that the one crucial thing is that we don't exceed a bit's cutting depth. That's why they have a cutting depth uh, specification on their specs and all, because we are, uh, when we exceed that cutting depth, then we are um, going to end up ultimately burning the shank in and stuff. And in the case of this uh, here, in the case of this profile cut here with the six degree with the half inch head, I'm not talking an end mill, right? An end mill is a straight bit. So when I cut that pocket out straight and everything, my shank can rub up against the edge. Not a problem there. I'm talking on this V bit where that V cutter was only cutting, you know, at that point down. And uh, my shank is now very down, straightening that area out and burning through it and stuff. Uh, completely different, which we'll be talking about end mills in, in just a moment. And all but let's take a moment and let's answer a couple of questions <clears throat> david says so Lenny, if you put a start depth of 0 0.05 does that tool start cutting 0 0.05 deeper on the first pass or does it work from the original start point and go to the extra 0 0.05 it plunges down at 0 0.05 from the first pass so you're starting from that point it's pushing that bit down to 0 0.05 which 0 0.05 is a little bit wide for a start depth uh, but it's pushing down to that start depth uh, at 0.05. It's not going to step down to it. It's going to push down and it's going to start carving from there down to the depth that it's supposed to normally cut. Uh, and I, when I say now, let me let me ref, let me kind of illustrate or re rephrase that. Let's let's do <laughs> let's draw a box here. And let's say that on that box that I set a start depth of 0.05. My bit is, and this is a very rough bit here. Um, <clears throat> my bit, rather than starting from here and then cutting to the normal depth that it would, would have normally calculated to, it's actually going to start here and then calculate from there the depth that it should cut to. And so it plunges down to that start depth and then it cuts from there. So if I were doing, even with a profile cut, if I were starting at an eighth of an inch and I want to cut down a total of a quarter, my cut depth would be an eighth of an inch. Starting at an eighth of an inch below the surface, cutting down an additional eighth of an inch for a total of a quarter inch depth of cut. If I were to say, think that this is the cut depth here, then I'm actually starting an eighth of an inch down, cutting down an additional quarter of an inch for a total of a three eighths inch depth of cut. Okay, so 
that start depth is pushing that bit into the surface and then from there it's going to count it's going to cut to the depth that it would normally cut to if it had a zero start depth good question david hopefully that answered it <clears throat> so jim asked what should the feed and speed be for v bits uh, and can just per minute and plunge be the same to answer your question um uh, like digital wood car uh, for an optimal for V bits, uh, it doesn't matter. You're living in pine, pop, uh, purple heart. You know, uh, the uh, cut and feed rates that we have them set their bits at is 35 inches a minute um, for the feed rate, 25 for the plunge. And the uh, you can absolutely go much faster than that on, you know, larger machines and things like that. I mean, you can run, you know, up to, you know, 100 inches a minute and things. Uh, but the uh, the quality of the cut may may get sacrificed uh, over that speed and all. Uh, so I would say with your V bits, you want a range of uh, between 35 inches a minute and 40 to 50 inches a minute, in, in my opinion. For a nice, uh, you know, clean uh, cut. And as far as the uh, plunge rate being the same, uh, the plunge rate can absolutely be the same. But understand this: that the most wear and tear occurs on a bit during the plunge. And depending on the bit uh, and the cutter and things, uh, we are bearing that bit straight down. And, um, you know, if we're ramming it down at, you know, at 50 inches a minute or 60, because that's what our feed rate is and stuff, then we're just, we're just putting the most wear and tear because there's, that's where the most wood is around the bit and it's going to just beat it up. So we usually want to plunge down nice and slow, uh, and, uh, and then progress into our cut. And this is where ramps is a big, uh, lifesaver of your bits. The ramping toolpath, uh, adding a ramp to your toolpath. Instead of a straight plunge, it allows the bit to ramp into the cut at a diagonal. And so if I had a total ramping, a zigzag ramp distance of a, of a uh, one inch, and let's say my cut depth was a quarter of an inch deep. Um, let's get uh, 0.25. Go two and a half inches. If I were ramping into this cut, what my bit is going to do is, and I hit the text box, so give it a second for that text box to open so I can close it again, <clears throat> is based on the overall distance to the depth of cut, it's going to split that cut in half. So it's going to ramp over that one inch distance halfway to that depth and then back. And so that bit is working. Ah, bear with me a second. Learn how to draw here. That bit, rather than plunging straight down to that depth of cut and cutting, it is ramping, only working one side of that bit. And it's gradually removing that material down to that depth of cut. And then it will progress into the cut when the flute is where it needs to be. You know, so ramps absolutely are lifesavers for your bits. Uh, I would recommend ramping. Uh, and Jim, I would not recommend uh, the plunge rate being the same as the feed rate unless we are doing a spiral ramp on the toolpath. If we're doing a profile cut with a spiral ramp, what that means is as that bit is cutting, it is, as that bit is cutting, it is gradually dropping ever so much through the entire cut. It's dropping and dropping. So think of a, the only analogy I have is think of a toilet flushing. <laughs> um, as it's going around, it's going down and it's dropping a few thousandths of an inch through the entire cut on the spiral toolpath. And if I don't put my plunge rate to the same speed as the feed rate, 
then as it's trying to drop, it's got to slow itself down just to get to that plunge rate to drop to that next step. And it's constantly dropping through the entire cut. It's constantly, constantly dropping through the entire cut. And if I'm having to slow down uh, just for that plunge rate and everything, then it's going to kind of get jerky, herky and everything. I want a nice, smooth round and round as I go down. So the only time that I would recommend having the plunge rate and the feed rate the same is if we were doing a spiral ramp. And the spiral ramp is only found in the profile toolpath. So hopefully that answers your question, Jim. <clears throat> All right, bear with me a second. So uh, suicidal at all times. <laughs> Is it better to uh, run deep or slow, deep and slow, or shallow and fast with an end mill? Well, the one thing that we don't want uh, to do with an end mill is we don't want to burn up the tip. Okay, so if I'm running uh, shallow and fast, then my cut is only happening, you know, at that tip of that bit. And if you've ever, you know, if you're one of those individuals that are, that are doing that now, if you ever look at your tips, you'll notice your tips are getting much darker in coloration and everything than the rest of your shank because we're not even utilizing the shank. You know, we're, we're, we're that tip of that bit is doing all the work and stuff. Um, the uh, optimal uh, thing that we want to do here, and that's why we have these options like in the profile toolpath for things like a separate last pass where the bit will do uh, at a distance away from the cut, it will do its in normal pass steps and things. And then on its final pass, when that flute is, uh, you know, at its fullest depth and everything, it will step over to the cut to do the final pass and do a nice cleanup cut. And we get rid of those witness lines and things. Uh, so to answer the question, as far as deep and slow, uh, definitely don't want to run slow. Um, because the slower I go, the more opportunity heat has to build on the router bit and the router bit will dull the heat, um, especially if we're not getting the uh, appropriate chip load and we're not getting the appropriate chips flying off. Heat is being concentrated on that bit. We start get wood burning. Our bit starts to burn and discolor. And then because of that burning and discoloring of the bit and that heat build up, then our bit starts to dull and we, we, you know, end up, you know, replacing our bits, uh, more often than not. Um, so I recommend running at a optimal speed at a normal pass depth for the bits. Uh, typically the pass depth is half the diameter of the bit, um, or less in some occasions. Uh, but if I had a quarter inch end mill, my pass depth would be about an eighth of an inch per pass. And, uh, I would be running, you know, uh, 55, 60, you know, depending on the size of the machine and what it can handle, you know, up to a hundred and you know, 25 inches a minute. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it all depends on the chip load. It depends on the material, depends on the number of flutes on the bit. Um, and it also depends on the RPMs that I'm spending it at and everything. So, but as far as that, I would not go deep and slow. Uh, I wouldn't go shallow and fast. I would find that happy medium and be at appropriate depth of cut at a an appropriate speed to where i'm getting the optimal chips i want nice fine chips flying off that uh because uh that chips those that heat is going to get dispersed away from the bit by those chips and everything keeping that bit running cool uh and optimized and um i want to do everything in my power to not build up heat so like adding ramps to tool pass um using the appropriate cut depths and the appropriate feed rate as well as the rpms uh, with a two flute bit, um, you know, I'm probably running around uh, 22,000 RPMs uh, on that bit, uh, running my normal pass steps, let's say, you know, 60, you know, 55 to 60 inches a minute. But if this were a three or four flute bit, especially if it was a four flute bit, I'd be running around 12,000 RPMs um, at that same uh, feed rate and speed because of the number of flutes. The gullets in those flutes are much smaller. and uh, uh, less, you know, uh, it's having to work harder, 
uh, we need that bit spinning slower so that we can get that chip out uh, with those smaller gullets and everything. Those chips are going to be much smaller and things. So we need that bit spinning slower. So we want those RPMs to be cut down almost by half because our flutes tri doubled. You know, I think. And so suicide at all times. I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully it did. <clears throat> And uh, Suicide follows up and says, also, does the ramp, can the ramp be set to clear the first cut? Like the end mill, uh, we'll be cutting the entire shaft on the first cut after, but after the first line uh, is taking the, uh, is it taking the step over cut? Let me read that one more time to myself. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I let me see if I uh, interpreted that. Uh, can the ramp be set to clear the first cut? Now, when you're calling, what are you calling the first cut? The first pass. The first pass. You know that uh, that first pass. Um. The. And it be uh, like the end mill will be cutting the entire shaft first cut, but after the first cut line, it is taking the step over cut. Okay, so it's taking the uh, pass step. The so yeah, I mean, if I'm taking my um, my eighth inch uh, pass depth and everything on the ramp now the ramp is going to uh you know depending on what the ramp length is and typically it's either twice the diameter of the bit uh or a little longer you know but i usually go twice the diameter of the bit but uh you know by the time it ramps it's at its full pass depth and it's taking that full pass depth rather than you know uh stepping down now if you wanted uh, you know and that's that's the pass depth if i wanted a cut depth of a quarter of an inch and i'm going to ramp down to that quarter and then you know take that quarter all the way through uh not going to happen i mean it could happen but man it's going to be putting a lot of pressure on that bit because at the ramp you know it's taken that gradual cut but now we're in its full depth of cut here let's say a quarter of an inch depth of cut and now when i start burying or plowing through that wood i'm taking that full quarter of an inch of wood uh during that cut and um would not i mean you know uh doable we do it with router tables all the time and stuff but uh not optimized not optimal you know for that bit um you know it's going to work i'd much rather it ramp to its first pass depth then take that full pass then it'll ramp to its second pass depth and then take that you know next pass um and everything so to answer that question uh is no it cannot be set for that um and uh you can you can set a ramp distance but the what that ramp cuts down to is going to be based on the pass depth of the bit and so now if you edited the pass depth to be the full depth of cut you know for that first you know cut or whatever then yeah technically you could do that but it wouldn't be recommended And again, hopefully that answers your question. <clears throat> because the last thing we want is if the bit can't, you know, if that router's moving along at a certain speed and that bit can't keep up, then that's how we get bit breakages and things like that, you know, uh, where the bit is just going to, you know, it can't keep up. So it's either going to, we're going to get big time chatter or it's just going to snap the bit. Um, and we don't want to break bits. Uh, and, uh, and also, Pass depth typically half the diameter of the bit or less, um, and adding those ramps and everything will help extend the life of the bit. And then, of course, making sure that we're running the correct, you know, RPMs uh, for the feed rate and uh, the number of flutes and stuff to get that chip. We want to see nice chips flying off of that uh, bit. We don't want to see fine dust. Fine dust means that heat is going to be building up, and um, and online there's there's chip calculators and there's uh little charts and stuff they're kind of generic uh you know uh the chip calculators and stuff um but the uh but they kind of you know help point us in the right direction and all 
and a lot of them are designed for large commercial end mills that can run you know up to a thousand inches per minute um and uh they're not optimized for smaller you know uh shop type you know garage shop or home you know small business type you know machines and stuff where the uh feed rates uh at capacity and the rapid rates are much slower and things and so the chip load calculators just kind of they get us to a general idea but they're not going to point us in the right direction all right and uh let's see here <laughs> hold on a second now um <laughs> All right, you guys are having your own little conversation i'm thinking they're like uh the next question was what's a computer <laughs> all right let's see what we got here um let's see this is where uh you know i would like to see a video with a four flute quarter inch end mill cutting with the correct chip flying uh would you be able to uh see that um yeah i mean you can see it in your shop too uh so a four flute bit um running a uh, quarter inch end mill, four flute uh, end mill running around 12,000 RPMs, uh, past depth of an eighth of an inch, running about, I would say, uh, 60 inches a minute. Um, you know, 55 to 60 inches a minute, you'll, you'll see those chips and things and all. But yes, uh, this is where the where I was talking about in the shop with Laney comes in to where we can start, uh, you know, looking at this now, of course. Some of the in the shop videos, I'm not going to be sitting there running the CNC machine and trying to teach you guys at the same time when you wouldn't be able to hear me. Um, uh, so most of those are going to be pre-recorded videos. So there may be videos released each week of um, these uh, different things, uh, but they will not be live events. You know, our live events would be like Tuesday night with one of the other nights being a pre-recorded video being released on, you know, various topics, you know, how to use Aura Mask or what a quarter inch bit looks like with a four flute cutting with the proper chip load <laughs> and what it looks like without the proper chip load and things like that. So all of these things uh, absolutely can be done, but you can also do this testing and stuff at uh, your shop, Jeff. Uh, you can uh, alter your RPMs. Basically uh, set an initial RPM and a feed rate and a plunge rate or you're not a plunge rate, but a, um, a, a yeah, plunge rate, but also a, a pass depth and everything for your bit and uh run a series of lines and cuts um and uh run one at one rpm with a certain feed rate and then if you have the ability like in our program our planet cnc tng i can slow or speed up that cut i can the feed rate i can slow it down by 10 percent increments or speed it up by 10 percent increments uh, otherwise i would just have a series of lines running at different speeds with different rpms to see what those cuts are and when my rpms uh you know as i as i'm or as my feed rate as i'm slowing it down when that cut starts to deteriorate and look bad then i'm going to pump it up another 10 percent uh and kind of get it uh right at that fine line and then i'm going to start playing with the rpms and i'm going to start lowering those rpms until that cut starts to deteriorate then i'm going to bring it up slightly until it starts cleaning and that's going to give me that optimal feed rate for the uh the the optimal rpms for the feed rate that i'm running and we absolutely during each of those cuts you would see a dramatic difference in the size of the chips that are coming off the way the machine acts how it sounds when it's cutting if the bit's struggling uh the uh you know whether it's making just fine dust and there's very little chip and you can experiment with that you know do it on cheap wood don't do it on nice wood you know you'll be wasting a lot of wood but it's uh it's nice and i have a little notebook next to my computer uh in my shop next to my cnc and when i'm running cuts and things uh, i'll have my normal toolpath set up and then uh from that toolpath i will alter the cut a little bit uh, you know depending on the material if i'm changed up my material stuff i'll alter that cut within the software as i'm running and as that cut starts to deteriorate i'll change that feed rate back up a little bit you know i'll bring it down first and then i'll bring it back up to where that cut starts to look clean again and then i'll start playing with the rpms uh, and all, and then when I find that optimal chip load, I write that down uh, for that bit, this feed rate, this material, you know, for my pine, you know, and then what I can do from there is I can come into my software 
and I can set up a category for on it and which already exists <laughs> and um, I can come in here and then I can start uh, bringing my tools over uh, for that material and start setting the feed rates and all. And so what this new version 10 allows us to do is create a bunch of different materials and have all of our bits in those materials with different settings for RPMs, feed rate, plunge rate, and things for that material. So we're getting the optimal uh, you know, uh, cut for each material because it's going to change by the type of the material that we're using and all. So we can absolutely break that down. And I, you know, I keep notes and then I come in and I translate that into my, into my tool databases and things. Um, well, thank you, Dean. That was very nice of you. Um, I appreciate that. Let me show what Dean said here. I appreciate that, Dean. That's very nice. Um, all right, Susano, is there a way to have a 3D multi-depth of cut be optimized to skip previous cuts Two depths to not have it go over the cut that are already depth, already to that depth. All right. Is there a way to have the 3D, 3D cut? I'm assuming we're talking 3D models. When you say 3D, multi-depth of cut, be optimized to skip previously cut the depth and not have to go over that cut that are all right, suicidal at all times. I need you to rephrase that question for me and kind of let's break it up into sections and everything. Because um, I honestly, I didn't understand that at all. And do me a favor and see if you can reword that in, uh, I hate to say it, a little bit simpler terms because I did not catch what you're trying to throw at me. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's see here. All right, so now let's talk about, uh, so hopefully uh, with this first start of this, uh, you guys have an understanding of, you know, how V-bits, how the angle of the V-bit and the cutting point length and the diameter of that cutter affect our cuts and things and, and why we want to have a variety of bits at our disposal, depending on the type of cuts that we're doing and things. And then ultimately, we also want to make sure that we, um, if a cutter does not have, you know, cutting along the flutes or the shanks and things like, you know, these half head, half inch bits do and stuff, we want to avoid uh, reaching the cutting limit on certain cuts like profile cuts and things like that. Now, pocket or, you know, V-carb cuts, it will step over as it's cutting, uh, reaching its past depth. But, and what I mean by that is, let's say that I have a cut here. A 60 degree angle cut here my bit is going to cut at its pass depth which if we look at the tool database for the 60 degree <clears throat> let me get back to my tool library here That's the 22, 60 degree. The 60 degree pass depth is set to 0.2 inches because the cutter is, you know, the maximum angle depth is 0.2188. So we're not exceeding that. So it's going to cut down, you know, to that 0.2 inches uh, and uh, it's going to make its first pass. And then at that point, it's going to be stepping over to make that next pass so we this material's all been removed now here so our shank is not colliding with anything and then it's going to be stepping over to its next pass and everything to reach that uh, that full depth of cut if this were a profile cut and i there you know and i was saying cut a let's say a half inch deep well, then my bit is coming straight down at that half inch and my cutter is cutting down here. I burrowed a hole, right? Down to that full depth. 
And now my shank, when this cutter starts to try to move to cut, not going to happen. There's no cutter up here, you know, on that. And uh, therefore, it's going to, you know, just start pushing my board around and everything. It's going to push it out of the clamps or it's going to snap the bit or it's going to damage something. You know, um, it will take pass steps, you know, on that profile cut following that line. It will take passes and all. But you want to make sure those pass depths do not exceed the cutter depth. You do not want that first pass depth to exceed the cutter depth. Or else you're just going to be pushing your material around and everything. And so hopefully that. Let's see here. All right, we're going to take, uh, let's see if I can get this question now. Um, let's see if we can get this. So a 3D cut to the depth of one inch. But the cutter is set to 0.25 each pass. It will cut uh, sometimes uh, parts uh, to what it needs to be the 0.25 inch per pass. But then it goes and does the full depth uh, when it recuts the stuff. Well, let's talk about 3D cuts just for a minute. Uh, let me let me make sure that you you know we're all on the same page here. A 3D rough cut uh, using an end mill uh, is going to clear away uh, the waste material, and it's going to step down based on the pass depth of the bit. So, depending on the pass depth of that bit, it's going to clear that material away and everything. A 3D finish cut does not make passes a 3d finish cut comes down to the full depth of that model and runs at that full depth only coming up and down based on the model and the contours that it has to follow but it rides at the bottom of that cut it does not make passes so it's not going to come down a little bit and then kind of do the model and then come down a little further and a little further it's running at the full depth of cut the whole time the 3d finish cut is that's why when the model is very thick and high um in the let's see here let's uh add another layer and shut these layers off for a minute On a 3D cut, my horse or my model here has a height currently of 0.6 inches from the bottom of the model to the highest point, 0. 0.6 inches. And then my, out of my three quarter inch material, that model from the top of the material coming down to that 0.6027. Uh, my end mill, my rough cut bit is hogging away, taking that eighth of an inch per pass, clearing it away down and leaving a 40 thousandths of an inch or whatever skin above my model because my finish bit is going to be riding at this lower level, only raising up to follow along the model doing the detail work. It will not make passes down. So if you have a very deep depth of cut, you absolutely want to do a rough cut to hog away that waste material. Um, so as long as you understand that, then I'm still kind of stuck. Um, let's see here. Let's go back. I, I, I want to get this. So the 3D cut to a depth of one inch, but the cutter is set to 0.25 each pass. It will cut some parts to what it needs to be in that 0.25 pass. But then when it goes to do the full depth of cut, it will recut the stuff at 0.25. Um, and then follow that up with and recut again when it does the 0.75 and one inch passes. Hope that makes sense. And, and yeah, it does. But what, it, what, what doesn't make sense is, is you're saying a 3D cut. The only cut that is going to make passes down to that depth and everything is going to be the, the rough cut. The finished cut is cutting at the full depth at the whole time uh, and everything. So the rough cut that's hogging away the waste material 
it's taking those passes and all. And I can understand exactly what you're saying. What, what he's saying is, is let's say that I had a rough cut here and, uh, let's, um, let's illustrate this. Let me, uh, let me block this in with a rectangle here for a moment. Let's say that this is my cutting window. And I'm using the selected vector and I'm taking an eighth of an inch per pass on that rough cut. When I calculate this tool path, and let's reset our preview here, that tool path is taking the entire cut um, in a, you know, at its pass depth. But then it's coming back and doing, you know, the entire cut at the next pass and the next pass. And let's uh, let's see if we can slow this preview down. Let's see if we can add our drawing tool in here and let's see if we can simulate this a bit. Um, let's not slow it down that much. And let's change this. Let's stop this for a second. Let's change this uh, piece of material. Stop the cut. That uh, that point. Um, all right, let's change this material to something a little lighter, maple, so we can see the cut a little bit better. All right, one more time. Let's preview that cut. And so we'll speed up that a little bit. And so what it's doing is it's going to uh, take that first pass. I should have turned down my resolution a little bit. Uh, the resolution is a little high. But it's taking that first pass uh, suicide at all times and uh, cutting down the eighth of an inch and coming back and taking the next pass. Uh, where the cut and then the next it's removing that material all the way through and if I turn down my preview simulation a little bit uh, so that it'll run a little faster for us not that fast get past that first pass step and all it's coming and taking the second pass now and removing all that material so I'm not sure where you're getting where it'll cut, you know, down, but then it recut because it's going around and removing the material that it needs to to bring that, and it's only taking the of an inch of pass, and it's bringing it down, you know, once at a time to where it needs to be. Um, in this case, the final pass right there, the final eighth of an inch create that rough cut and it's taking those steps and everything and it's removing or only cutting where it needs to cut so i'm not seeing where you see that because the finish cut now um when we do the finish cut then that finish cut is riding the full depth there is no passes it's not cutting air or anything like that. So I'm not sure where you're coming across that, um, because uh, typically it's it's going to be taking the steps and removing the material where it needs to remove the material at those steps or those passes. Not you know not steps, the passes and stuff. Uh, so and I, I I know you say I got what you're saying, but I think I'm still misunderstanding it a little bit because I don't think I'm answering it uh, the way that you're hoping. <laughs> Uh, so after this uh, calculates here, so if we were to, let's slow this down a bit and preview this toolpath, that bit is riding at the full depth. And that's why we usually leave about a 40 thousandths of an inch skin and things. And let's uh, speed this up just a little bit more. And the only time that bit is raising off that bottom cut is when it is, uh, you know, rising up to cut the contour of the model. So it's going to go up and down, up and down, but it's it's running the full depth of cut. There are no passes uh, in that in that uh, bit. It's a full depth of cut path, and so it's absolutely crucial that you guys and girls use rough cuts when it's absolutely necessary. 
if the cut is too shallow, if it's a 3D cut that's very shallow, the software will tell you. It'll say, hey, I'm not going to create a rough cut. You know, it won't let you. Um, it'll, it'll say, uh, you know, no toolpath was created and stuff because it just doesn't, there's not enough depth. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, Suicidal at All Times jumps back and says, well, maybe it's because I had it set to raster. Well, uh, one thing, uh, raster, um, you had it set to offset, not raster. And you see me, I have mine at raster. Well, typically when we're working with a 3D model, we want to cut with the grain. A raster cut goes around and around and around. So that means I'm going with the grain, against the grain, with the grain, against the grain, with the grain, against the grain. And that means I got a lot more cleanup that I got to do when this cut is done. A lot more sanding and cleanup and everything to get rid of those tool marks that are going against the grain. If we raster with the direction of the grain back and forth, then we're going to have less cleanup, less sanding, less after work to do and things. So I always recommend rastering uh versus offset cuts um when it comes to 3d models and working with the grain because the last thing i want to have to do is come in here and all this detail work and start doing a lot of fine detail sanding and try to get in those tool marks and things out because i was going with the grain against the grain with the grain against the grain with the grain against the grain i'd much rather cut with the grain and reduce my sanding afterwards because i do not like to sand that'll be a recommendation <clears throat> all right so <laughs> there you go i'm gonna throw this up dean i appreciate that and if you guys and girls do like these types of videos or it, it, my videos at all definitely uh the thumbs up helps support the video a little bit so uh i love them thank them uh please do you have to give us a thumbs up all right so let's uh so hopefully that answers some of the y'all's questions all but let's get uh let's talk about bits now now one of the what let well actually we're in models and all let's kind of talk about bits with models one of the things that i see more often than not is uh and, and i want to you know make sure that we clarify this right here and right now is that when individuals are calculating their finish cuts they're coming into their tool path let's get into the tool path here they're coming into their tool path and they're going into their tool database and they are uh, grabbing their eighth inch ball nose bit, right? Eighth inch ball nose. And uh, they're calculating the tool path off that. But yet in their machine, they are using their eighth inch tapered ball nose. Eighth inch tapered ball nose that has a quarter inch shank with a 7.2 degree taper which would be uh, 90 minus 7.2, 90 minus seven is uh, 83.2, it'd be 83.8, somewhere along there, something like that. Well, oh, I got to wait, hold on. I got to put the ball at the end. Oh, face that. Let's come over here. A point give it give it give it let me see if i can zoom in and get it come on down here step over one oh you son of a gun don't fight me right now my mouse is hot and heavy uh and then let's uh throw a line here space bar and let's turn that line into an arc there we go now let's join that bit together join probably not the uh the straightest looking bit it looks a little crooked and all that but you'll get it now a ball nose bit an eighth inch ball nose bit uh let's go eighth inch wide Point one two five, and we'll give it a half. We'll give it a two inch overall length. And let's come in here into node editing, and let's throw an arc at the end of that. So an eighth inch ball nose bit has the same size shank as its ball. Uh, and let's get out of node editing here. 
And so when I calculate my tool path for a ball nose bit, eighth inch ball nose bit, my tool path is not accounting for that 7.2 degree taper. So if I've got my tool path calculated for an eighth inch ball nose bit, but I'm using a tapered ball nose bit uh, in here, then I'm not taking into account that taper and therefore my cut lines and everything are going to be completely off by that, you know, that degree. Uh, so when that bit is uh, coming through and cutting and all based on those lines, on the step over, on the pattern itself and all, it's not accounting for the taper of the tapered ball nose bit that I have in my router. And so many times do I see this, that people are choosing ball nose. And I always ask them like, hey, is your ball the same size as your shank? And they're like, no, it's a quarter inch shank, but an eighth inch ball. I'm like, well, that's not a ball nose. That is a tapered ball nose okay that's a tapered ball nose and that side angle plays a very big role uh and things in there in the calculation of that tool path and how those lines are calculated and everything so make sure that you're using the correct bit when you're calculating your tool path if it's a tapered ball nose it needs to say tapered ball nose you know it needs to be that tapered ball nose with that degree of angle because, and let's take a look at both of these tool paths. Uh, let's calculate this 3D rough cut with an eighth inch ball nose. Let me get down to my ball nose, eighth inch ball nose, select and calculate. And I'll just use the model as the boundary this time, calculate. And then let's uh, come in here and calculate another 3D finish with the tapered ball nose. <clears throat> Give it a second. It's almost there. So let's uh, come down here and turn off the uh, ball nose. Let me see which one's which. Bear with me a second. That's ball nose and that's tapered ball nose. Let's turn this off. Okay. So um, in our tool pass, let's go ahead and preview that visible tool path. And again, this is why you don't, you, you do a rough cut. You see how much meat it's got to hog away with just a finish cut. That bit is trying to hog it away. And on that ball nose bit, we don't have a flute that big. We'd be colliding this whole time. All right. And um, now let's take that off. Let me see if I can. Bear with me a second. Let me see if I can do a bit of a rough cut to hog away that waste material. Where's my rough cut at? Rough cut. Let's get through this rough cut real quick. So Ronnie asked the question uh, while we're waiting for this to calculate is, uh, um, uh, Lane, do you use a sanding mop on your 3D models? Uh, I use a sanding ball uh, from Harbor Freight. Uh, I haven't bought a sanding mop and all. I haven't tried a sanding mop or anything. I use a sanding ball. It's shaped like a ball and usually, you know, 180 grit. Um, and uh, I'll use that uh, in my drill press or something. I'll even chuck it up in my lathe and uh, crank that thing up high and, and use it to sand with. Sometimes I'll put it in a drill. Um, I'll use a Dremel with uh, sanding tools and stuff if I have to get into fine details. 
Um, and uh, let me recap. Bear with me a second, guys. Let me uh, give me just a second here. Lord have mercy. Let me see what vector I had selected. Oh, I didn't have a vector. That's why it was. Give me a second. I got to put my vector back in here. <clears throat> dum, da, da, dum. So I can illustrate this clear. Try to get all that wood out of the way so we can show this difference between a ball nose and a tapered ball nose tool path but uh yeah i'd like to use this i'd like to try a sandy mop and see how that does um i don't i don't you know it'd have to be a certain fine mop so it can really be flexible and all because the last thing i want to do is sand away any of my uh detail and stuff you know Okie dokie, toki dokie. Okay. All right. So now that we have a clear path and we can see our model here, uh, let's come in and look at our uh, 3D finish cut with our eighth inch straight end mill. Um, and we can see that the uh, eighth inch end mill uh, is not able to, you know, get down to the sides because of that straight shank and everything. You can see under the jawline, uh right here around the edges and everything and you know on our 3d finish cut the same thing but look out if let's see if we can do them side by side because there's more root there's more meat here because of the taper let's see if we can how can we do this side by side um what's going to be the best way to do this but i'm dumb uh let's see if we can get up, up close and personal <clears throat> So on our straight bit, you know, our bit, first of all, is, uh, you know, only, you know, using the models, the toolpath, it's not getting over to this contour because we have not set any offset and everything. We're just using the model as the toolpath or as the uh, boundary and stuff. But on that straight bit coming down, that's a straight shank and all, it's able to get, you know, uh, further. Well, with our tapered bit, uh, we have to account for the you know the angle of the taper and everything which brings it you know and man i wish i could do these two side by side i think we can if you will um and our line differences between the two uh and the spacing and all based on the taper let me see if we can turn off one versus the other so this is our line spacing here on the 3d finish with the taper bit oops turn that back on and now turn this one off and this is our line space based on this bit. and they're two completely different spacing you can see this on where my mouse is that's one this is the other and if i'm using i'm calculating for a straight and i'm using a bit then my cut is off by that much. Um, this is a straight bit here, base here, here, so on and so forth. And my tapered bit is over here, 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 and here. And so if I'm running a tapered ball in my router, but I've calculated it with a straight ball my cut is off by that 7.2 taper and therefore entire cut off. So don't do that. You calculate your toolpath, not just choose a ball nose if you're not using a ball nose. A straight ball nose is a straight ball nose. A tapered ball nose is a completely different tool. So also referred to as a conical ball nose. Uh, for those of you wondering what the hell the tapered ball nose is, conical ball nose bit. Uh, it comes down to a conical point with a ball at the end. All right. So. Let's see here. Stockroom Supply has some great, uh, I got to throw out a shout out to Stockroom Supply. They sell our machines, but they have, uh, you know, uh, in Canada, they have a great, uh, you know, mops and everything. And then also Klingspore in North Carolina, Klingspore Woodworking. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. 
Let's see. You guys are just having a good old chat by yourself. Uh, let me see if I'm missing any questions. So you use the sanding mop. I already answered that one. Um, didn't recalculate the rough cut. Yes, I didn't on that one. All righty then. Use color on the different finishes. Use uh, color on the different finishes. Uh, someone was saying when I was doing the uh, preview. Um, the let me zoom out. Let's see here. I don't know if that'll work because it's this. It's kind of essentially the same cut. They're a little bit different, but let's see if that'll work. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Preview tool file. Let's come down here. This is my straight ball nose. Let's give that a color of red. And the tapered ball nose. Let's give that a color of something really obnoxious, neon green. All right, let's reset the preview. And let's preview. Let me recalculate these. Selected vector. Ooh, I need to clear out the whole thing, so I got to recalculate them. Select the vector, calculate that one. <clears throat> or else we won't be able to see it very well. Dum -da -da -dum. after all this time i hope this demonstrates what i wanted to show okay all right let's preview that one first uh preview that visible toolpath <clears throat> we gave it a cool we gave it a toolpath color of red Now, and there's our green. So it simulates some somewhat simulates the uh, the differences. You know where those tool paths are. I wouldn't want to paint it that way. It looks ugly. <laughs> but that might help demonstrate the uh, that taper, that pass depth and everything versus the straight and all. So we absolutely got to, you know, take an account for that and just don't make that mistake of, um, you know, calculating your tool path with a ball nose when you're using a tapered ball nose. Or don't calculate it for a tapered ball nose when you're using a straight ball nose and so on and so forth. All right. So let's get rid of that. <clears throat> okay. Now let's talk about some of the main common things. V carve toolpath, uh, the main tool is a V bit, right? But then we can use uh, clearance tools, flat area clearance tools. And in the new version 10, we can use multiple flat area clearance tools. Now, the flat area clearance tools can be V bits themselves, they can be end mills. They can be ball nose. They can be tapered ball nose. They can be, um, you know, uh, form bits and things. So typically we're using an end mill, a flat bit uh, to do those flat area clearances and stuff. But we are able to use multiple types of bits uh, within uh, that type of toolpath. The V bit is the main tool. And the clearance tool is going to be, you know, for that flat area clearance tool, you typically would use an end mill, but you can use multiple types of tools for that. I have seen more than once where an individual is using a ball nose for their main tool because tapered ball noses are tools that can be used in that V-carve cut. Um, and um, they're doing that to, instead of get a V shape, they're taking that, tapered ball nose to get that angle of that taper and they're getting that round bottom cut 
Um, so in the example of this, let's do, 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 do. let's um, let's do this. Hello. Make this bold. And let's go one point five inches tall. Set that there. And let's copy that down. Holding the control key, not the shift key there, buddy row. <clears throat> All right. So on this cut here, if I were to use a 60 degree V bit. Calculate that. And on this one here, if I were to use a tapered ball nose. And calculate that. All right. Let's preview that visible toolpath. What we end up with is a kind of a round radius to bottom uh, with that slight, whatever our, in this case, 7.2 degrees is the taper of that bit versus a V-carved toolpath, which of course is cutting at a V shape. So if we wanted that kind of rounded off, you know, edge at the bottom and all, we could use that. And that's why the software allows us to do so. That's why when we come in here and look at our tool, notice the only tools that are available to us are tapered ball nose bits or V bits, right? Everything, all of my other bits are hidden, you know, at this time. Uh, and if they're, you know, tapered ball nose bit or V bit, tapered ball nose bit or V bit, you know, uh, all of my end mills, all of those things are hidden. So we can use either one of those two. And on the tapered ball nose bit again my angle of the cut is going to be based on the angle of the bit uh, and then it'll give me those little radiuses down in the bottom edge and everything of that cut the v bit is going to give me that angled cut where it v's and to that point in the middle and um i'm going to get those you know nice round or you know nice square edges but one of the big distinct differences between these two One of the big distinct differences between these two is, let me see if I can come up here, on the V bit, and let's see if I can close this toolpath here. If I can give this a uh, little bit of color. <clears throat> oh, that didn't help at all. All right, we'll use it without the color. Turn straight up there. On the V bit, I can achieve those sharp square points on those inside and outside corners uh, because of that V bit and that nice point. On the ball nose bit, my outside corners are rounded as well as my inside corners and things. So a uh, very distinct difference between the two. <clears throat> so be mindful of that, you know, depending on what type of bit you choose for that. When it comes to a profile cut, once again, a profile cut Anytime you are following a single line, whether it be a straight line, whether it be a circle, whether it be a, you know, L outline, whatever the case may be, when you're following a single line doing that outline cut, uh, that is a profile toolpath. Whether you're cutting on the outside of the line, on the inside of the line, or on the line, it's a profile toolpath following a single line. Okay? Uh, you know, whatever it is. You're not engraving between the lines. You're doing an outline, if you will. And <clears throat> with this toolpath, we can use any type of bit. It could be a roundover bit. It could be an OG bit. It could be a dovetail bit. It could be a V bit. It could be an end mill straight flat bit. It could be a diamond bit. It could be whatever. Um, it could be a laser engraver. You know, we're following that single line. 
And so we can use multiple bits with this because we're, we're we might be trying to achieve different looks or different things. Um, I may be trying to uh, do a round over or a bead cut. Um, and let's say that, let's say I come in here and I come in and I want to go a quarter of an inch. Uh, let's go an eighth of an inch deep. And with the tool, I want to use a, do I have one? Let me see if I've got one in here. All right, let me draw one. You're about to learn how to add a form tool to your tool database. Uh, I'm gonna draw a beading bit. Uh, so this bit uh, is basically going to be a half inch wide, or no, what is it? Three eighths of an inch wide, 3.5. Uh, it's got a height of, I think it's a quarter of an inch, and it's got an internal radius of eight. Let's see here. No, it is bigger. I'll get it right here in a second. There we go. All right. And let's delete this. Let's delete this. Let's go into node editing here and let's cut the vector there and let's cut the vector here. Let's delete this half. Select this here and We'll even give it a little bit of a, of a straight edge here. We'll go about a sixteenth, roughly. Let's join these two bad boys here together. Um, into one. All right, let's go into our tool database. Let's go to, I'll just put it up here, Imperial Tools, add a form tool. Let it draw out that beading bit. Uh, we're going to go, let's see, what's my, hold on, I'm going to discard that for a minute because I want to do a measurement here. What is my measurement from here to here? 0.125, and what is my measurement from here to here horizontally? 0.125. Should have known that. I'm an idiot. Okay. Let's go in here and uh, let's um, select our profile. Let's get out of this tool. I should have known that. I drew the thing. Um, all right. New form tool. Pass step is going to be 0.125. Uh, step over is going to be 33.3. Nope. I want to step over an eighth of an inch. Let's actually use this box over here, 0.125, so 50% of the bit. Uh, feed rate, <clears throat> go 50, and a plunge rate of 20. Apply, and let's grab these two lines here. And I'm going to end up with a double bead. I don't know how far apart those lines are. So let me do this. My bit is a quarter inch overall. So if I take this and offset it outward, let's go five. Oh. All right, profile cut. I'm going to go an eighth of an inch deep. Um, I'm going to go, that should give me to my full depth of cut, and I'm going to choose my beading bit. And I want to cut on the lines, calculate that tool path. Let's come up here, preview that selected tool path to create that 
beaded cut, that little bead in there, if you will. Um, and you know, I might be doing, you know, faux beading in a cabinet, you know, a cabinet door or something like that. And I want to use my beading bit to create those, you know, those beads and stuff. Um, I'm going to use, I'm going to be following that single line, but I'm using a beading bit to do it or a V bit or, or a ball nose or a dovetail bit or whatever, a keyhole bit. If I was making a keyhole cut, um, and so the profile cut, a lot of times when people think of the term profile, they think cut out, you know, I'm cutting out a profile shape I'm cutting out, but it could be to any depth. It could be any bit and everything. And you're just a profile toolpath is when you're following a single line, whether you're cutting on the outside of the line, inside or on the line. Um, and the bit you choose is basically going to be what, what type of cut you're trying to achieve. And in this case, I was trying to create a bead. So I had my spacing between my two straight lines using my beading bit based on that spacing to get that full round over of that cut. Okay. Um, and the pocket cut, once again, same scenario with the pocket cut. I can use any type of bit that I want with a pocket cut. And it all depends on what type of pocket that I'm cutting. What, you know, uh, typically where pockets are mortises, dados, rabbits, grooves. Um, and we are using a flat end mill to create that pocket. We're removing material from within the primitive design. But at the same time, we could also be doing a chip and dip bowl or tray. And so we're using a bowl and tray bit to pocket out that area. We're just removing material from within the perimeter of the design. And, um, the, when it comes to what tool do I use, it all depends on what you're, you're wanting your cut to look like. So an example of this would be, let's come over here and let's say that I have this rectangle here, square corners, and I want to pocket this cut out. And on this pocket cut, I want to cut, uh, three eighths of an inch deep. And I'll use a quarter inch end mill. Now, on my quarter inch end mill, the one thing that I have to be aware of is if we come back and look at this cut, that quarter inch end mill is going to give me a eighth inch radius on the corners. It can't reach into that cut. So now I want a flat bottom bit to pocket out this, this cut. But now I come down to the choice of what diameter bit do I want to use. In this case, I want to minimize the radius in the corners. So if not a quarter, then, you know, what about an eighth of an inch in mill? So let's go with our eighth of an inch. Calculate that. And now I'm reducing that. And even yet, you know, depending on how, you know, what my depth of cut is and if I have a bit that can do that. You know, I may even be using a 16th of an inch end mill to further reduce the cut, you know, to get that, minimize the radius in my corners, you know, for this pocket, uh, whatever little bit that it couldn't get, you know, I would have to clean up with a chisel if I needed to fit this, you know, into a square piece or whatever the case may be. Um, so we're using an end mill to clear out the cut. All three bits are going to give me the same result as far as the pocket. As far as the pocket's concerned, all three bits are going to give me the, the cutout, removing the material from within the design. But each bit's diameter is going to change the radius in the corner. And so I'm going to be choosing my bit based on, again, what my need is and what I'm trying to achieve. Now, if I took that same pocket cut, and I decided to use a V bit on my V bit here. We'll use a 90 and calculate this. Well, what this is going to uh, do in turn is it's going to pocket out that cut and it's going to. Um, 
have to clean out that flat bottom. It's going to give me that flat bottom. It's going to give me that 90 degree wall. But I want you to see what happened here. I've collided my well, not really on my 90 because I have cutters on the edge. So it, it's going to be cutting straight down and then it's going to angle out, you know, that 90 degrees and then it's going to try to flatten that bottom. But if I would have been the 60 degree white 1541 bit to do this, then I would absolutely on this straight ledge right here, I'd be sliding my shank into that cut and all because it would not be, you know, stepping over and everything, you know, appropriately and all. So we've got to be, you know, mindful of the type of bits we're using, why, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve uh, in everything. In this case, I would not want my V-bit trying to flatten out this pocket. If I wanted the angle, angled walls, then I would do a combination of two tool paths. My pocket cut would be, and let's reduce the depth of cut here so we don't collide. Um, my pocket cut would be a combination of my end mill and my end mill i don't want it to cut up all the way to the edge so i'm going to use a pocket allowance i'm going to make it stay away from that edge by a certain amount uh and uh let's say um you know let's give it uh i don't know point one eight seven five it's a positive number and that way when it calculates that tool path it's going to stay away from that edge and uh you know let my v bit do the rest of that uh you know to give me that angle cut into what i want so now i'm going to do a profile tool path Cutting to the same depth of cut, cutting on the inside of the line with my 90 degree V bit. And when I calculate that, then in turn, I have the two tool paths that are going to give me the flat bottom with my angled walls. Now, notice here that my 90 degree v bit did not get down uh you know i did not give myself enough of an offset away to have that angle come all the way down um the 90 degree v bit if we take a look at this and this is what the 2d view and solid view this is what it does for us that 90 degree v bit is cutting out to here Yet my end mill is cutting all the way to here. So I have those straight walls and I only have that V cut down to a certain depth and it drops down. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, I want to see how far out I'm cutting. So I'll turn on solid mode. I can see this. Now I can actually take a measurement, you know, from here. Let's do vertical measurement. From here to here. And I can see that, you know, roughly, I'm a little shy on there. So let's say a half inch right half inch so then what that tells me then on my pocket cut i'm going to have a 0.5 allowance <clears throat> let's see if i'm thinking the right way on this one and let's preview reset the preview and preview my pocket cut and then my V carve cut preview visible tool path. Oh, oh, 0.5 is my whole diameter of my bit. So what is that? I need to go back to there. Another quarter of an inch, right? I'm an idiot. Third laning, come on now. You know better than that. 0.25. 0.25 offset, preview that visible toolpath, and that should give me that nice angled wall into my flat bottom, and my V-bit's not trying to flatten out that bottom, so I'm using a combination of two toolpaths to achieve that cut, you know, that I, that I want. And on my V-carve cut, my V-carve cut, that profile toolpath, not V-carve, I'm sorry, my V-bit cut with that profile toolpath, 
if I did not want those rounded edges, I have the option of external sharp corners or internal sharp corners, you know, uh, if it was a 3D and stuff, but external sharp corners and stuff. And what that should do is, uh, actually it is the internal. Is it the internal? I mean, come down here. Corner areas. 3D allowance tool cut out. Yeah, my calculate. There we go. Uh, reset the preview and preview both of these tool paths again. Preview the visible tool path. But by setting that external and external corners, I get the nice corners at the angle instead of those rounded angles. And, you know, I get that internal corners. And on that profile tool path, what you saw there is the software, when I chose internal sharp corners, it told me the allowance the allowance for the cutout tool, quarter of an inch. And if we look at our pocket tool, quarter of an inch, you know? So it tells us what the allowance is uh, and everything. And so depending on what cut you're trying to achieve, what you're look at, you're going for, what you're trying to do, you're going to use a combination of tool paths or a combination of tools. Some tool paths can only use certain tools while others can use all the tools that are at your disposal. Uh, and you, you, you know, you're going to mix and match. And I hope this is all making sense. Um, and Crystal, thank you. She, Crystal is like, it is internal. She's like, it's internal. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, it is an internal cut. And, um, and so, uh, a lot of people, when they ask that question is, does the software tell you what tool to use? No, it doesn't. What you have to do is determine what's your finished result. What are you trying to achieve? What, what is the look that you're going for? And what tool paths, whether it be one or a combination of, that are required uh, to create that look and everything. So is any of this uh, you know, uh, helping you guys out or is it just boring you to death? I don't want you guys and girls to fall asleep yet. So let me know. But let's go back and let's see if we have any questions after this. Because uh, you guys were having a nice, good discussion by yourself. So I'm just, uh, uh, but um, let's go back to here. Laney, how can you add a router bit like a white side D1455? Uh, would, I have, uh, would I have tried form tools, but that does not work. What am I doing wrong? All right. So the D1455, let's take a, a gander at that tool. So we're going to jump into Google over here and we're going to go right side. E14-55. And let's look at what this bit is. Let's go into our images here. All right. So the 1455 is a dovetail cutter. So keyhole cutters, dovetail cutters, and cutters that have an undercut you cannot draw or add to your tool database. You will be adding those tools to your tool database as what's called a dummy in mill. Okay, so if uh, we close up these tools here for a minute, we come to my dummy bits. I have two dummy bits uh, in here. One is for a keyhole bit, and the other is for a 3 8 inch dovetail bit. And basically, the tool, uh, you're going to have your dovetail bit, that D1455, in your router, but you're going to be calculating the tool path based on this dummy end mill, um, you know, based on that, you know, it'll have the same diameter and all, because what it's going to be reading is it's going to be reading the RPMs, the feed rate, and the plunge rate. And I want you to notice something. This is a dovetail cutter, so I don't want to take passes. I don't want to take passes on this. So my pass depth is three eighths of an inch, taking the full depth of that cutter. Because when I'm doing a dovetail cut, most likely I am, uh, you know, using an end mill to hog away the waste material. And then I'm going to take that dovetail cut and do a full pass to do that dovetail. But it's set up as a dummy end mill because you cannot draw in a tool that has an undercut, um, a form tool, such as a keyhole bit or a dovetail bit. You have to set up a dummy bit 
and it's only going to be reading the RPMs, the feed rate, uh, the plunge rate, and the pass depth, and everything. So uh, that's why you're having a hard time with that. You can't um, you can't add those type of tools to your tool database. You have to set up dummy bits for that to, that where it uses the parameters and all. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, let's see here. And that was a very good question, uh, Jim, because uh, a lot of people don't, you know, don't, they don't know that and they're struggling with it and stuff like what in the heck? And um, it's just like the uh, thread cutting bit that I have where the V is on the side of the bit on uh, the thread cutting bit. You know, it has its shank. Um, and then the actual cutter. Is. A. V shape cutter and i'm not going to do this justice uh right now but very rough drawing uh on the fly but because of the undercut and everything i can't add this tool to the tool database so i would have to um come in and set it up as a dummy bit a dummy end mill you know okie dokie it's okie dokie all right so let's go, uh, let's see here. Ah, oh, you're very welcome. All right, let's see here. Helping, all right, good, helping, helping. Everybody says it's helping, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's see. So suicide at all times, uh, Keith, Crystal, welcome. I think, uh, I, I don't, uh, if I haven't been paying attention or whatever, but you, uh, and Dean as well, welcome. Uh, if either I'm not paying attention to my audience or you guys are new, um, thanks for dropping in on me. Uh, we're just talking about end mills and bits and dovetails and all kinds of stuff. We're just trying to understand how the, you know, the use of bits and, and how we would, uh, utilize them, uh, to achieve our cuts. And now, the last thing that I wanted to kind of uh, touch on is kind of a little bit of a, uh, not a project, if you will, but I want to kind of show an example of using a bit and um, going beyond its cutting depth, uh, which is going to ruin your cut. So in this case, uh, let's see if I can just do it very simply with a T. I'll make that a little bit bigger. <clears throat> and I'll hold down the control key and drag this over to the side here. Um, I want to mirror this, even though it's a T. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, mirror it. And I'm going to put a box around it. There we go. All right. Think of a V-carve inlay, if you will. I have my female cut, and then I have my male part that's going to be cut out of a contrasting piece of material that's going to flip over into this and fit. And we're going to use a V-bit to do all of it. And let's say that I'm using a... Uh, 60-degree V-bit... Uh, or even a 22 degree V-bit or something. Uh, but let's go with the 60, the white side 1541. That's where you, that's the one that kind of gives the most trouble because it just goes right into the flute. Um, let's say that my cut depth on this was 0.3 inches. And start depth of 0 0.0 on this guy right here. Okay. And I calculate that tool path. And I hope I gave myself enough room. Let's get back out here. I wonder if I made my inlay big enough. All right, let's preview that visible toolpath. Okay, and it would help if you're going to demonstrate this, Laney. It would help if you use the right bit. Not a ball nose. <laughs> we need our 60 degree uh, V bits. Um, okay, one more time. Now, the cutter of my 60 degree V bit. Uh, only has a cutting height of the white side 1541, only has a cutting height of 0.2188. And my cut depth for the inlay is going to be 
And so uh, preview the visible toolpath and everything. And notice here that, you know, it's not quite getting down in this flat little area here, 0.2989. So we're, we're there, you know, almost and all and everything. But it was a pocket inside pocket cut. So it was stepping over the whole time during that cut, right? Well, and the opposite side of things, you know, typically we have uh, on the male part of the VCAR toolpath, we have a start depth. Let's say in this, in this case, we'll go with a start depth of 0 0.1 with a flat depth of 0 0.2 for a total cut of 0.3. We want our male to be the same height as the female, right? 0.3. Now, let's calculate that toolpath. And let's make sure that uh, I used the right fit on that one. I did. I did. I did. All right. Now, if we preview this. Okay. Let's come in and examine this. <clears throat> we have that 0.1 depth here. Then our 0.2 for a total of 0.3. My cutter only has a depth of cut of. 0.2188. So I have this ridge at the top of my V carve inlay. Can't fit a square peg into an angled pocket. Okay. It will not fit because of that, because I've exceeded the cut depth of that bit. So what bit we use when we're doing the V carve inlays and things like that, it plays a very, very big role. In this case, for both of these tool paths, the more appropriate bit if I was going down to point 0.3 would be the uh, larger head diameter bit, which has a cutting di depth of, you know, 0.4375. And again, where did we get that from? Let's go back to our V bits here and our layers and our dimensions. Where's my dimensions at? Oh, did I delete my dimensions? I did delete my dimensions like an idiot. Well, anyway, our 60 degree V bit has a, with a wider head here, has a cutting depth, point depth. We don't want that straight edge in there. Can't fit a square peg into an angled hole. Um, but it has a cutting depth of 0.25. So even at that, I'm going to be at my straight edge here. So we don't, that's, that's not the bit that I want. So let's look at the 60 degree V bit with the half inch head. That was the 90. I measured like a goofball. Uh, let's grab this one, measure here, and oh, yeah, that'll be good for me. So let's come in here. Let's select that bit. And let's come back to, let's turn everything off. Don't need all this stuff on anymore. And once again, get out of our tool, close that. Let's select our vector here and calculate that tool path. We'll reset this back. And let's now calculate this tool path with the 60 degree V bit. And calculate. All right, let's preview the visible tool pass, both of them. And there we go. Now, we can fit an angled cut into an angled cut. And, you know, on that V-carve inlay, how, you know, if, uh, for those of you that, that don't really know how that works. All right, let's go with a... <clears throat> Cut here. This will make sense in a second. Let me draw it out first. Mm 
work with me, Junior, work with me. Scissors. this control pull that over to here now let me use my scissors okay all right so i've got my v cut my female pocket uh that's coming down and it's most likely you know coming down to uh the point three whether you know it gets limited to that depth or you know it flattens right or you know it v's right out either one but then i have a male cut that is going to be raised up let me see if i can demonstrate this raised up um, it's actually going to be starting at point one so let me hit escape on that Who's texting me? Y'all know better than that. Unless y'all can't see me or hear me. Oh, you're probably looking at me. Here, let me make that bigger so y'all can see what's happening. All right, let's take these guys here. And this is a very rough drawing. Not to scale, so don't hold it against me. But my yeah definitely not to scale let me uh let me redraw that da, 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 da. actually i don't need to redraw it. Let me move that in on my male part i have a certain uh you know start depth and things uh where those two parts will fit together and they're only going to fit down so far and I drew my piece too big. It actually would be much smaller. It would actually be about that size so that when it goes down into that V cut, it'll fit more. Um, but the start depth and the cut depth on the mill, we have to have that nice angled wall. We cannot exceed the cut depth to where we have that straight ridge because you can't get that straight ridge. You'll end up with a gap you know here or the part just won't fit at all and this is a very terrible illustration um i have a v carve inlay uh video uh on spindle tv that you guys can look at with and a much better illustration and layout of this uh but what i would you know uh, recommend is definitely check that out but it's very important the type of bit that we choose and the cutting height of that bit versus our inlay depth now on this inlay depth, uh, typically I don't go with a, on that V-carve, I won't go with a 0.3 cutting depth on the mill. Uh, typically my flat depth on the mill is a 0.2 um, depth of cut. Again, because I like using my 60 degree view bit, so I don't want to exceed that. Um, and then on the mill cut, on that v car for that inlay my start depth is big uh it's going to be 0.18 and my flat depth is 0.02 i want very little space you know glue space at the bottom i don't want a big air gap in there so i want the bit to start at 0.18 and cut down to 0.2 to um 0.02 not 0.2 to create that male cut. So it's gonna start down 
here uh, and, um, you know, give me a much tighter fit in the two parts. I wish I could, I wish I could really cut these out and just flip them over and stick one in there to show it to you. But this is where the, in the shop videos, where we're in the shop, uh, maybe we'll do that and I'll do some V-carve inlays and we'll cut them in half so you can see the different glue gaps depending on your start and, and, and depth and all. But I don't want to get hung up on it, but I want to just, you know, I wanted you to see using the appropriate V bit, I get that nice V angle from the start, you know? I don't get that ridge straight up. If you see that ridge, that straight up and down vertical ridge at the top of your nail cut, recalculate, or else those two parts aren't going to fit together. You're exceeding the cutting depth of that cutter, you know, based on its, you know, its dimensions and size and stuff. I just probably created about a hundred more questions. You guys are like, okay, now that just brings up a whole new list of questions. Um, let's come on down here. Let's see what we got. Um, are you retired? You guys are still talking to each other. I keep thinking you're asking questions and those are, you're asking those to each, each other. All right. Good. All right. Any questions up to this point? Any questions on the demonstration of our, let's reset this preview. Uh, preview the visible tool pass or reset the preview and let's open this up. Got a lot of tool pass in here, but let's select. All of these. Any questions on the V cuts using different V bits uh, and things as we discussed and how those V bit choices and all are, you know, our relationship to our depth of cut, the width of the lines, how deep our, you know, text might engrave or not engrave and things uh when we use bits with our profile toolpath versus a pocket cut how that changes dramatically uh and things and then how we can exceed the if i get this to spin around properly we can exceed the cutting depth spin down there um and this is all pixelated now because i'm using a lower resolution but uh, how we can exceed that depth of that cutter and end up colliding our bit into our material. Any questions up to this point? All right, so yes. All right, so. Warren, can you use a 0.25, then go clean up with a smaller bit? Absolutely. Um, so that is one of the things that it wasn't available in versions 8, 8.5, 9, 9.5, but in version 10 of the Vetric software, one of the things uh, that we have now is the ability to uh, come back in with a smaller bit and clean things up. So let's take as an example here. Um, let's take as an example here. Let's trace that. <laughs> All right, let's turn the fading off. So we can see our image in its full glory. And let's turn our fading off so we can see that. And let's pull this up to right about there. Preview, apply, close, turn off our bitmap layer, <coughs> ungroup. Uh, this image come down here and delete that part and let's say on our little tiger here um, let's f9 to get him in the center in our v-carve toolpath uh, we have the ability let's start at zero uh, the top of our material no flat depth on this uh, we're going to use a 60 degree uh, v-bit um, and if we were to calculate this, we have some overlapping lines that would need to be cleaned up. Let's reset this preview and get back into full view here. 
spin around. All right, so if I was V carving this, there's no you know clearance tool pass required or anything like that uh, you know for uh, the uh, the tool. But what if I wanted this to be raised? What if I wanted that raised effect uh, to where um, you know there's going to be a pocket around it. it's going to kind of be raised within the cut? So let's say, for instance, that I have this here, and let's say that on my tiger, I'm going to offset him outward by a sixteenth of an inch. Select the new. Uh, when I click that offset button, hopefully I didn't click it twice. There we go. I can deselect this outside perimeter and all that other stuff. I'm going to hit delete to get rid of it. I just wanted that outside perimeter that goes around to create a little island around him. And now if I come in here and select all of this and do the same V-carve toolpath, this time an absolute flat depth is required. So I'm going to do a flat depth of an eighth of an inch. And now I'm going to use a flat area clearance tool. And for this, I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill for my first tool. Uh, but then I'm going to come back with a eighth inch or a sixteenth inch, uh, whatever the case would be. I can add as many tools that I want to this. Um, you know, cut. I could add as many flat clearance tools that I want to this now uh, to optimize the cut so that when we calculate this tool path, again, we have overlapping lines. I'll have to clean that up one day. If we come in here, uh, let's close this for a minute. And on our tool pass, we have three tool paths that are end mills, quarter inch. Eighth inch. Did I choose the eighth inch tapered ball nose? I did. I'm an idiot. Hold on a second. Let me open this back up. I chose. Let's remove that one and remove that one. I don't know why I was in my ball nose category. Let's do that one more time. End mill, eighth of an inch. End mill, sixteenth of an inch. <laughs> And I would probably only stop at the eighth of an inch, but I'm just showing this as an example. Let's recalculate that tool path. Again, we'll get past that. Continue anyway. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, reset that preview. And once again, I'm gonna pull this out by double clicking on it. And so I've got three tool paths that are end mills, my quarter inch, my eighth inch, and my sixteenth inch. Then I have my V-carve. So if we were to uncheck these, and let's move this over to here, my quarter inch end mill is going to clear out a majority of the major area, uh, followed by my eighth inch end mill, which is going to get into the tighter areas where it can fit that the quarter inch bit couldn't. And then my sixteenth of an inch end mill is going to go even further in, uh, clearing out those details. That, my, that neither my eighth or my quarter could fit into. And then ultimately my V-carve is gonna come and do the final detail work. So if we were to uh, view these one at a time, let's uh, slide him over a little bit. Let's get rid of this. There we go. Give ourselves some room so that we can put this over here for a moment. All right, one at a time. Let's preview the visible toolpath of the quarter inch end mill. Okay. Then our eighth inch end mill is uh, going to come in and clean up where it can get, where the quarter inch couldn't. And then finally, my sixteenth of an inch end mill is going to come in and get where that eighth inch or that quarter inch couldn't. And then after all of those flat areas, my V card bit will finish things up and finish that off. And that's going to give me that raised effect and stuff. And so, yes, to answer the question, you can use multiple bits um, to uh, clear out. Uh, you can use larger end mills and then your smaller bits and all. You can come up and clean up on those cuts. And that's not just for the V-carve toolpath. You can do that for your pocket cut as well um, and, and things like that as well. But the V-carve toolpath has the option... Uh, for the multiple tools, multiple clearance tools and things. Um, your profile toolpath does not, uh, you know, um, 
and I don't know why I'm saying profile tool path, your pocket tool path. Pocket. Uh, you can add a, an additional large area clearance tool. So I could, if I was pocketing something out, I could have a small bit that's going to do all my, you know, close tight work. And then my larger bit would do the larger clearing work and things. But the V-Carve toolpath, we can now optimize it more and we can add as many bits as we need to really hone in on this. If we were doing this cut with only the quarter inch end mill, the V-bit would be taking over. So if we were to do this cut with just the quarter inch end mill, calculate it. We end up with continue. Tiger King, I like that. Thanks, Crystal. Um, tiger is my favorite animal in the world. I was born under the sign of the tiger in Chinese astrology, if that means anything. All right. So with this, um, if we were to calculate this tool path here, uh, and we preview these two cuts, my quarter inch end mill would do it the best it can. My V bit would then come and where the quarter inch bit couldn't fit my V bit will have to go in and flatten those areas out uh, in the cut. And it's a little pixelated because I'm using a low quality. Let's see if we can pump up the volume on this. Pump that up a little bit and get rid of some of that pixelation. And let's preview that visible toolpath one more time. <clears throat> there we go. Now we can see those tool marks a little clearer. So by using just the one end mill, my V bit has to do a lot of work to do, uh, you know, the best it can to flatten out these areas and everything. By being able to use multiple end mills in there, then I can take advantage of that. Um, by, and I, I could, I could just, I don't need to use the eighth inch. I could jump right down just straight to the sixteenth, have the quarter inch and the sixteenth inch bit, uh, and calculate and give myself that extra tool path. And that 16th inch can absolutely fit into those areas. So it would, um, you know, then clean it out. But yeah, that was a great question because uh, it's, it's especially, you know, um, now, you know, it's much a newer feature within version 10 that we can use those multiple tool baths. And so even at my 16th inch end mill, you know, it still couldn't get quite everywhere. So my V-bit had to take over. And the software is exaggerating the cut. It's showing you the where the tool marks are, where the V-bit is cutting, but it actually does a pretty decent job of flattening the areas out and everything. So just keep that in mind and stuff. And then of course, you know, give this a little bit of color and pop goes the weasel. All right. All right, all right. Let's see here. <clears throat> Yeah, Paul, uh, this is exactly what I want to achieve. So uh, like Paul said, Laney tonight has helped for a lot of different fonts that I was having trouble getting to look right. And that's exactly what the whole point of this is, is uh, based on our fonts, on the spacing of our lines and things, and the tool that we're using, picking the right tool to get the best look possible is going to be. And this is why we constantly want to... Uh, I'm not saying run out tomorrow and hundreds of dollars on bits and all, but we want a selection of uh, bits. What I recommend is that in everybody's tool, they at least have a half inch in mill, a quarter inch in mill, an eighth inch, and a sixteenth inch. Those four end mills. For V bits, a 22, 60, 90, 120 degree V bit. Um, you can even divide that even more and go with an 11 degree and a 30 degree bit. Uh, but uh, but the 260 and the uh, 120 that's that gives you a arsenal of uh, V bits to choose from uh, and things. And when it comes to tapered ball nose for 3D model finish and detail cuts, uh, quarter inch tapered ball or ball nose. Uh, Eighth inch tapered ball nose, sixteenth inch tapered ball nose, and a thirty second inch tapered ball nose, which has a sixty fourth inch radius for really fine detail three D finish cut. And eventually, you'll have this nice collection of tools uh, for the primary you know tools that you're going to be using most often, and uh, you'll be able to achieve you know with those fonts, Paul, and things like that. You'll be able to achieve many 
different uh, looks and things. You know, and you'll get that that result, especially if you're doing things like like scripture and stuff like that. I mean, imagine if uh, if you will. And I'll make these files available to you guys and girls, but imagine if you will, let's go real quick into a cut here. Let's go into our, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this will be the last thing that we do for the evening. So any questions you have, type them in now. And, um, <clears throat> but this will be the, the last little demonstration. Let me get down to here. And, <clears throat> Sorry about that. Didn't mean to clear my throat. Got a frog in my throat, and I really want to take a sip of soda. So hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. Ooh. Okay. All right. So this is a 3D model of a book, right? Well, just any we can all see it's a 3D model of a book. I'm gonna go into the object properties and I'm gonna turn off the fading of that so it always stays dark so I can see the contour and the curves of the page. And by the way, just so you know, on our object properties, um, typically it's default, you know, like halfway, right? So when we select the model, we can see the contours and all. When we're uh, doing something else, it kind of hides those contours and stuff. Right click on that and go to the, you know, select your model, right click and go to those object properties. You can turn that fading off. So it'll stay no matter where you're working at on your screen that, you know, it'll stay almost like it's selected so that you can see those contours and curves. And um, let's uh, <clears throat> take a minute here and go into our text. Let's go with a quarter of an inch. Uh, that's too small. Let's go half inch. Oh, it might work. All right, bear with me while I type this out. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Anyway, why are you doing Christmas themed stuff in freaking spring? I don't know. It's the first thing that came to mind. Bear with me. All right, so um, let's do this. And let's uh, kind of give this a nice little font. It's kind of funky. We haven't done our distorting yet or anything like that. Um, let's give that a little bit of a boldness. All right. And then uh, let's say that was the title. And let's come down here and... <clears throat> All right, let's break this up. Close the night. I don't know why I have a capital N on there. I would not be a good writer. Make it work and fit on my book. Let's get this one off the house. Uh, let's get it off of center. Use the left alignment. Gotta make it fit. Bear with me, bear with me. And all through the house. That'll work. Okay. So let's say that, you know, um, we wanted our, you know, this book, you know, on our 3D model and our, our words have got to follow the contour and everything. Well, first of all, uh, our, on our text and everything, we can't have overlapping lines, right? That's a no-no. So we're going to weld those uh, together. Um, and uh, this as well. Let's weld that together and replace it with our text that's now welded together. And um, then we got to come in here and we got to start to distort the text so that we can get it to follow the curve of the book so it looks like it's actually laying on the pages and stuff and let's see here 
Same thing with this. Let's get, let's close that and let's get this distorted. And we want it to kind of follow into the curve of that book and out the page. Okay, that looks good. All right, just for right now, that looks fine. Um, now, in here, uh, you know, I've got a 3D model cut, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do a uh, a 3D rough cut for right now, or a 3D finish cut for right now for time's sake. We're gonna use a tapered ball nose bit. We'll go with an eighth inch tapered ball nose. Uh, we're gonna use the model as the boundary. I'm gonna let the bit go past the model just a little bit so we can kind of see around the book edges and stuff. And uh, we'll calculate that out real quick. Hurry up. Yay. Look at that. I got all kinds of... You guys are doing good. Yeah, it works to get the idea. Absolutely. Look at all those thumbs up. Woohoo. I appreciate it, guys. I really do. So um, let this calculate. It's almost done. It's working on it. It's working on it. One of these days, I got to get a screen where uh, it's not so glary on my glasses. Don't ever get old, guys and girls, where you have to wear glasses. I used to have perfect vision. Now I can barely read a tape measure without these things on. It's terrible. Got to go get Lasix or something. <laughs> All right, let's get back. Our model is uh, finished. Now, one of the most important things that we have to understand, when we have a 3D model cut, uh, and um, I am actually going to uh, stop that. I'm going to reduce the quality of the simulation uh, for time's sake. Uh, so it's going to be slightly pixelated, not much. I don't want too much reduction. But uh, let's do that again. And let's turn off the material color and let's preview that visible toolpath just for time's sake so it kind of speeds up. On the text, the bit that I'm about to choose is very critical because this is a, in, it, in its own right. I mean, this model, the, the material size itself is only like, uh, 12 by 6. So this is a very small model. So the text in itself is very small. Uh, and imagine if we, you know, we're actually trying to write out the first kind of uh, page of Twas the Night Before Christmas, you know, in this book, in this 3D model for Christmas, you know, that we're going to have it sitting on our mantle or our table or something or a coffee table and all. And those texts, that fonts even got to get smaller so we can get more words in. I only got the first sentence in you know, and it took up the whole book. So we'd have to make that much, much smaller. And that means those lines are going to get finer and finer. And my, my 90 degree, my 60 degree bits, you know, they're not going to cut it. Uh, I need, I need, you know, 22 and 11, you know, somewhere around there to get that definition, or I need to put a start depth in. The only problem I have to face is if I put a start depth in, then my letters could start to blend together and it looked like, you know, crap. And I could change my font and all, but I don't want to change my font. I, I like what it looks like and on. I want to make it work. So I got to use the right bit. So let's go ahead and uh, select our text. And let's go to the VCarve toolpath. And no flat depth, zero start depth. Uh, we're going to do two. We're going to do two different uh, bits to start off with to see which one looks better. First one's going to be our 60 degree quarter inch bit. We'll hit select on that. We're going to turn off the clearance tool. We don't need that. And we are absolutely not going to forget that we have a 2D vector and a 3D model in the same project. So we absolutely have to project that 2D toolpath, that V-carve toolpath on to the 3D model. So it follows the curves and the contours. Don't forget to project. So I've got three open vectors that were identified. Uh, they're going to be ignored and that's fine. I'll, they're most likely little trash things and all. And so if we preview this visible toolpath and everything, doesn't look too shabby with the 60 degree V bit. Um, 
you know, and I really wish I could turn the, the clarity up so it wasn't so pixelated. Uh, getting about, um, you know, a, a good amount of depth uh, in the cuts and everything with that 60. But let's recalculate that toolpath with our 22 degree V-bit and see if we can improve that sum. Calculate that with a 22 degree V-bit. And yes, I have my open vectors. Kind of curious as to what they are. We'll find them in a minute. Once again, we got to reset the preview. Can't, you know, add wood back in. Uh, so we'll preview those two toolpaths once again. And while we do preview those, while those are cutting, we're going to go in and answer some questions. Let's see here. <clears throat> This is a great question. Still want to know what the difference in, in setup resolution and view resolution is. All right. Um, here, while well, that's calculating, let me open up a, another uh, VCard Pro. <clears throat> All right. In a, the original setup of VCard Pro desktop or Aspire, doesn't matter. Uh, we have three defaults uh, when we're doing our job setup. We have three defaults on model resolution here. We have standard, which uses 1 million pixels, high, which uses 3 million pixels, and very high, which uses 4 million pixels to generate this 3D image that you see floating around here. Right now it's empty, there's nothing on it. This absolutely plays a major role in the translation of our cut. If we are using a low resolution and we're working with 3D models, our model is gonna be slightly pixelated. And that pixelation is going to translate into the quality of the cut. So we want to work with the highest resolution possible when we're working with 3D models. Now, hidden within this uh, software, if we hold our shift key down and hit create a new file, in our job setup, we now are uh, presented with two additional resolutions, one that uses 8 million pixels and one that uses 16 million pixels. Now, generally, these two are hidden. The reason being uh, is typically you would use them when you're working with building models. It's typically something you would see more in Aspire when you're actually creating models from scratch. You want to create those models in the highest resolution possible uh, because I can't bring a low quality model into a high resolution project uh, and think that it's going to turn my model high resolution. The model is going to be the same resolution that it was created in. So, you know, as a default, um, I recommend at least the very high resolution, whether you're, you know, working with models or not uh, for that, that 3D view. Now, that is for 3D modeling resolution. Okay, very important. So that means when I'm working with a model, and we'll just throw a, We'll throw a, not an apple. Come on, give me something better than that, guys. We'll throw a little duck in here. All right, so that model resolution, um, you know, we're going to have less pixelation when this model is created around these edges and things because that is going to translate into the quality of the cut, okay? So if I were to have created this job, same model, Kind of get that visual, right? Get that visual, get that visual. Uh, let's file new. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, file new. I want to save the changes of that. And let's turn that resolution down to standard. And bring in that same old model. Let it regenerate. We have much more pixelation around his paw up in his, could be a her. I don't know why I'm being so sexist. Uh, it's wing, um, you know, it's tail feathers and things around the edges and all. We have much more pixelation and that's going to translate into the quality of the cut. Uh, our cut, there's no, there's no improving it. Our cut, when that toolpath gets created, it's getting created on this model. It's following every one of these pixels and ridges and things. And so it's creating those toolpath lines. So our bit are going to cut, you know, those ridges and, and things and stuff in there. So 
when it comes to job setup, you want the highest resolution that you can when you're working with models to reduce that pixelation. And when you're previewing tool pass, which has nothing to do with models, when you're previewing tool pass, you want to preview the toolpath simulation in its highest quality, you know, and it's going to slow things down because it's using much more pixels. Uh, you know, we're using um, uh, much more pixels from our standard view, but this is going to reduce the pixelation in our block of wood here so that when we carve something, uh, it will reduce that pixelation. Like right now, that you know, twas the night before Christmas, right? You see how, uh, you know, kind of pixelated that is? If I were to copy that, and paste that here and do a v carve toolpath no projection because there's no 3d model calculate that i got you i got you uh and we turn up our simulation quality we'll go extremely high preview the visible toolpath All right, let me see. Let me get this into the similar position here. Zoom in. Right about there. So this is, you know, with a higher resolution as far as the preview of the cut. And whoop, this is the lower resolution. You see all the pixelation around the edges and everything. And if we look at this one, how nice and crisp it is. Now, if I even went higher, maximum, and preview all toolpaths, it's going to take a little bit longer because it's using more pixels, but it's going to take more longer to create that toolpath to show me and everything. But uh, much less pixelation around the edges and things uh, versus if we're in a low resolution. You can see how much more pixelated that is. So hopefully, suicide, that answered your question. Hopefully that, and I had your question up the whole time. So hopefully you guys got to see that. So this is a low pixel view. So we're in our simulation quality. We're just very high, you know, probably, uh, you know, a few million pixels. And in our other view, we are in the extreme, which makes it, you know, much more crisp and less pixelated, you know, on the cut. So that's for preview simulation quality and the other is for model pixelation quality okay two very distinctive different things uh even though they kind of you would think they're the same but they're not <clears throat> okay let's get back to our twas the night before christmas here um and uh in this tool path oops daggum it closed let me go back here Oh, did I? Did, oh, God, I'm so freaking stupid. Oh, I hit the reset button. <laughs> Wait, did I hit the reset button? Hold on, I might not have. Did I Did I just close the preview? Oh, it's the other. Thank goodness. Okay, but all right. So with the 22 degree V bit, getting back to where we were, you can see how much more clear the cut is in the definition how much more definition we have in that cut with that 22 degree v bit versus what we had with the 16 degree v bit 60 degree not 16 16 degree v bit so again bit choice is very important in this the angle of the bit and stuff all right ladies and gentlemen it is 10 o'clock we're all getting loopy here uh let me see here let's see what we've got any last minute question If you if you go back to 2D, while it is calculating, it usually will be quicker. Uh, it is on my computer anyway. That's an interesting one. So when it's calculating the toolpath, uh, you're talking about when it's or when it's previewing. If you go back to the 2D, it'll be quicker, and you can flop over, and it'll be done when you come back, type of thing. I don't know. Let's try that out. Not on this one. <laughs> 
because we're going to wrap it up here. Um, we'll definitely, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, that's a good tip. I'll see how that works. Um, talking about color, can you change the color, the blue color on the 3D preview uh, to view uh, when you get the finished calculation, but don't use, wait, hold on. Can you change the blue color on the 3D preview, the view you get when you finish the calculation, but don't use the preview toolpath? All right, Tippy, there's one of those stumblers. One of those stumblers. Blue, the blue on the toolpath. Uh, I'm assuming, are you referring to the toolpath lines? Like the blue, can you change that blue color on the toolpath lines? Um, or the, uh, the blue in the 2D view right here. This is what's called the solid view. So the solid view shows me where the diameter of my bit is cutting. If I want to get from, I can change from wireframe to solid by toggling up here. So the wireframe view shows me the center of the bit and the direction of the cut. Okay, all I see is the wireframe of that toolpath in the 2D view. Uh, the solid view shows me where that actual bit is clearing out and cutting and everything, which is great for when I'm doing pockets or inlays where we want to do a little bit of a allowance to let that bit overcut or undercut. We can validate, make sure that we went the right direction and everything. Um, but can you change that blue color? Are you wanting to change it to a different color or were you asking if you could just change it so it's not there? Um, if you ever see the lines in your design guys by, and girls, by the way, that just means you have a toolpath visible. So it means a toolpath is checked. Uh, you can uncheck it to make those go away. Or you also have at the top of your screen in your view bar, you have the toolpath visibility. You can toggle on or off at the top here. And then you have solid or wireframe view in that. But um, hopefully tonight, in some kind of weird way, gave you a little bit of insight on how to choose your tools, what tools to use with, you know, the different tasks and all. Hopefully it gave you some insight on, um, you know, how you can, you know, depending on your result, what you want as the end result, what toolpath or combination of toolpaths is going to be required to make that result become a reality? Um, or is it just a matter of choosing the right bit? Who knows? Could be both. Um, and uh, hopefully with what we reviewed tonight, it gave you a little bit of insight and helped you out. All right. Until next time, that's right, Crystal's using my phrase there. Until next time, there you go. Love it. Um, I want to thank you, everybody, really very much for um, coming out and hanging out. And uh, we're going to try something. Oh, I got to shave. Uh, we're going to try something next week. We're going to do uh, Tuesday night, regular night. We're going to create a design. And then most likely it's going to be Thursday or Friday. I'm actually going to take whatever we create and I'm going to do a video. It's probably not going to be live because I'm actually going to be out in the shop and putting it all, but I'm going to take that project to finish and I'm going to film that and release that video uh, probably Thursday or Friday. We're going to give that a try. And can you guys see my eyes? That's nice eyes when you can see them. Um, the, and uh, we're going to see how that works. Uh, we're going to try to break up some of these classes a little bit. I didn't want this to be, I don't know how it turned into a three hour class, but anyway, uh, I'm going to try to break the classes up to, from beginner to advanced and things, or, you know, kind of break it up a little bit. So for anybody that's new and just getting into this and uh, needs the fundamentals to where, uh, you know, you'll get the fundamentals and, and not be jumping too much over your head. I don't know how I'm going to structure it. I mean, it's almost about like I have to do a video, you know, every day you know, in a sense to kind of break it all up, to spread it out. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know next week we're going to create something and then I'm going to be taking it out into the shop and I'm going to be filming the making of it, whether I'm using, you know, from start to finish, paint, finish, carving, all of that. I'll film that and that'll be live. No, it won't be live. Uh, it'll be that. Now, when we're doing discussions in the shop at the CNC machine, talking about techniques and things like that, then we'll be live and all. But either way, 
we'll get that figured out. Okay. All right, everybody. Until next time, I'll see you soon. Thanks for joining me.